p.m. Uh, uh, town council. and Downs uh, Credit Enhancement Agreement. And I'm going to ask uh, the town manager, Tom Hall, to yes. oversee the presentation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we appreciate that there's multiple audiences here, uh, the workshops with council, but we appreciate this is being broadcast and we see it as it is our first opportunity <coughs> to talk not only about the project, uh, but also more in many people are really interested in uh, the financial components of the credit enhancement agreement. So. Uh, forgive us, some of the territory we'll cover may be uh, the Council's heard, but we really want to make sure that we put it in the proper context uh, for those watching at home and those in attendance. So we're going to do a shared presentation. Uh, Rocky Ruiz Barrow is going to do the first part, and I'll, I'll finish it up on the second part. Our goal is to complete our task in 30 minutes or less and leave uh, the balance of time for questions and comments uh, from Council. So if that's acceptable, without further ado, Rocky, you want to get us started? Sure, I'll get us, uh, get us started. Uh, for those at home, I'm Rocky Risbarrow III, representing Crossroads Holdings, LLC. Uh, I have at the table with me tonight Peter Michoud, my partner, and Dan Bacon uh, of Goral Palmer, our planner. I uh, appreciate the town council taking time to uh, hear us tonight. So uh, tonight at the workshop, what we wanted to uh, talk over with you folks were uh, some specifics about our plan. And we've taken our direction from the comprehensive plan um, our plans have uh, vision. Uh, we feel they have the right mix of residential and commercial growth. Uh, we think it's a responsible and directed growth. Uh, we think that we are creating uh, value and a good ROI, uh, not only for ourselves, but for the town. Uh, we have extraordinary <coughs> infrastructure costs, and I'll get into that uh, briefly in my presentation. And I'm going to tell you why a partnership is critical. So uh, we took our direction from the 2006 uh, and to some extent the 2018 comprehensive plan. Uh, in those plans, uh, the Scarborough Downs was recognized as a regional center and growth area. Uh, and that's shown on the uh, map of Scarborough to the right. Uh, Scarborough Downs is the biggest uh, piece of land in the circle. And it coincidentally is, is virtually the geographic center of the town. Um, where the Downs was recognized that it could accommodate significant uh, sh a significant share of the town's residential and non-residential growth uh, in those plans and that a compact and efficient uh, placemaking uh, could be accomplished with uh, this project. We have uh, come up with what we feel is an ultimate build-out master plan that checks all the boxes uh, in the comp plans and in the required by the zoning. Uh, I won't get into a lot of detail because I've done that in the past on the master plan. I'm happy to answer questions on that if you have them. Uh, but the pie chart on the right really shows what we're trying to accomplish with the Downs with 40% of the land area of uh, open space. About 20% would be light manufacturing and industrial. 20% uh, would be commercial and civic area and about 20% residential. We feel that that is the right mix and it's a very responsible mix which will produce a good ROI for the town. Um, that's a snapshot of the downtown area uh, which uh, for point of reference the largest building on the left uh, at the end of the fields is the existing grandstand, which we envision would be repurposed as part of uh, building out a town center. We envision a, a park area, a uh, place for hotel, and a lot of mixed use uh, retail, uh, restaurant, and uh, residential surrounding it. Uh, these are just a few uh, slides that I'll go through really quickly uh, that, that kind of show our vision of what this could look like. And there's a shot, again, of the existing grandstand. In the corner of this shot, you see what we uh, would envision could be a, a, a town, uh, town center, um, community center, uh, and how it could, could fit in with our, our uh, plans. That's a snapshot of potentially looking up what we would call Main Street. You can see the town uh, community center uh, is at the far end on the left. You're looking towards the park. It's hard to see in the shot. Uh, but to the right is the uh, grandstand. There's another shot of a shared street, kind of the end of Main Street, right at the uh, end of the, the park area. And a, a photo of uh, what it might look like from inside the grandstand looking out uh, as we uh, repurpose the grandstand. So uh, those were a few uh, slides of what we think uh, the downtown could look like. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of work that's got to go into that to figure out uh, what it is we really want, but we think that there's great potential here. Uh, the slide on the left you've seen uh, in the just recently, 
Um, that's a slide showing our ultimate build out that we think is the most responsible mix and produces the best ROI model for the town. Slide to the right is another snapshot of what a build out could look like. Uh, we think that we would end up with less open space, a little less light manufacturing, a lot less commercial and a lot more residential under a scenario where we don't have a partnership with the town. Uh, and we, we say this uh, with, with some confidence in the fact that we know we need, uh, we need assistance to get the infrastructure in the ground to produce the slide to the left. This slide uh, has been modified since some people saw it last because we realized we were not ha in harmony with the town's information. <coughs> what this slide demonstrates is simply thinking about um, housing within the downs and within the town uh, as it exists. The downs is to the left, the existing town uh, to the right. Um, in the downs in our, again, our preferred build-out scenario, we would, uh, we would have 38% single-family uh, detached dwellings, uh, about 32% of one to four unit dwellings, and about 30% of five unit or greater style dwellings. When you look at what exists in the town, you can see what jumps out really quickly is the fact that the town has 77% of all dwelling units are single-family residential units. And we think that illustrates, uh, we're trying to illustrate that we're going to come up with a really good balance here versus what the town has existing. And we know, I think it's, it's a general rule of thumb that, you know, those single family houses have the potential to produce, uh, or to, to produce the most demand on services, if you will. And so our, our, uh, our mix is uh, certainly more balanced uh, than what exists in the town today. Um, this slide is, is a new one. People probably haven't seen it. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, based on information that we got right out of the comp plan. And this slide really demonstrates what's happened in town uh, since 1940. And you're looking at mostly 20-year segments. In 1940 to 1960, we gained 3,576 residents. 1960 to 80 was 4,929. I'm not going to read all the numbers for you, but you can see that we've gained you know, 3,500 to 5,000 residents every 20 years uh, since 1940. The 3,053 figure that you see is actually a 16-year, uh, that's 2000 to 2016. But we're on track to, to, to be three to, uh, three to 5,000 residents. The point of the slide is, folks, the growth is going to come to this town. It's been coming. Um, the current growth management ordinance will allow that kind of growth, and, and it's, it's simply coming. Our, uh, our desire is to work with the town and help uh, the town direct that growth to the downs because we feel it's the appropriate spot for the growth. Um, this I thought was a compelling slide that we saw the other night. I think I stole this slide from Karen's show, but I've, I've highlighted um, the current town is the left column, the downs uh, and how it stacks up is the right. And the points that I want to make here are we have 8,500 existing units uh, residential units in town. We have 7,632,000 square feet of commercial space. And that all sits and is served by 161 miles of public road. At the Downs, <coughs> we're proposing a little under 2,000 residential units and a little under 2 million square feet of uh, commercial type space on eight miles of road. This, folks, this is smart growth. This is an, a, an extremely efficient use of the space that we have with the downs. And uh, I mean, you can only imagine uh, the, you know, the maintenance costs on 161 miles of road versus eight miles of road. And so this is really how, uh, a part of why the ROI model works very, very well uh, for the town. Um, this slide uh, demonstrates what we think uh, a projected value would be at 20 years uh, if we have a partnership with the town and we are able to achieve our highest and best use master plan as you've seen it. Um, we think we can achieve $615 million in, in dollar value. We think somewhere around year seven or eight uh, we could activate the downtown uh, and we've made provisions for that in our uh, credit enhancement agreement. Uh, the lower uh, line is if we don't have a partnership and we are forced to do this all on our own uh, uh, with no help, uh, we think it's going to be then more market driven. Uh, we're going to have to go, uh, we're going to have to use the utilities that are there and we're going to have to keep 
extending those as we go, probably more uh, from the Route 1 end than anything, working our way towards the far end of the property. We think the ultimate build out is probably worth around $225 <coughs> million, uh, without that partnership. So a significant difference in value at 20 year build out uh, to the town. This uh, slide deals with our costs and our extraordinary costs. Um, we've tried to simplify uh, this slide tonight, but we're showing um, the downs. I, I should back up a little bit and say the downs is a 500 acre site, about 300 acres are developable, uh, but we have no utilities uh, that can be used for the development actually on the site. So we have to go to Route 1, Highest Parkway, and the Payne Road to get those utilities and install those utilities. So on the left-hand side is some base figures of what uh, typical costs would be, totaling about $150 million. On the right-hand side are the extraordinary costs uh, that will come into play as we develop this master plan. Um, so it's important to note that you know total is about $265 million. We anticipate uh, what we'll have to spend to develop this property. That has not built a building yet. That is just infrastructure. Uh, greenways, uh, environmental restoration. Uh, so the, the numbers are, are quite large. It's quite a large investment for my partners and I. Uh, and that's why we're, we're looking for some help uh, with our CEA with the town. Uh, I'm just about done with my presentation. My, so my key takeaways uh, for tonight from my presentation are, folks, the growth is coming. <coughs> the downs will allow us to have responsible, planned, growth and it will be directed in the growth area. It's where the growth should come. Uh, the town, uh, we hope, will partner with us so that we can accomplish that. Um, our plan, uh, if we get our CEA, will allow immediate economic development to happen with the uh, light industrial uh, area being our next step. So we'll get immediate results uh, very quickly. This, um, allowing this master plan build out would help fix the mix in town of residential versus non-residential. Uh, it's part of how we fix, we think we fix the revenue uh, issues that we've been, we've been facing. Um, our CEA uh, anticipates absolutely no borrowing uh, from the town or by the town. We will fund all of the money to make the improvements to the property. We're assuming, the developer assumes all the risk and all the upfront cost. And uh, my final point is a portion of the downs tax revenue only would be used towards this investment. So if the town creates a downtown TIF in a larger area than the downs itself, which, which has been talked about and makes sense to me as a resident, um, our portion, our, um, uh, the money that would flow back to us is only coming to us from new uh, growth, uh, new, uh, new funds uh, that we create at the downs. And I think that's important to note. Uh, our money would only come from the downs based on <coughs> new growth. Uh, I think that's it. Thanks, Rocky. Left and right. Not bad. I took five minutes from you? <laughs> no. Excellent job. So, uh, my part, there's a couple of transitional slides. I'll make quick work of these. Uh, these are really, uh, we've estimated the economic impact at build out. Uh, so, we're looking at between 2,500 and 3,100 jobs, uh, potential 3,600 people, and estimated 350 school age kids based on the housing types that they've proposed. Uh, almost 2 million square feet of commercial space, uh, $650 million in value. Uh, which equates to about a million dollars in tax revenue annually. These sh should be noted that's at build out, and these are 2018 numbers that we're quoting. Um, by our analysis, there's a net positive impact, uh, a, you know, a positive ROI. Certainly, we have revenues that exceed our costs, and then some. We'll get into that in more detail momentarily. Uh, and as Rocky said, it does move us closer to our goal of 25% non commercial. Uh, this slide is simply intended to uh, show you an order of magnitude <coughs> would represent. And it assumes that it is built out uh, magically today and kind of lands in town. And the percentages um, at the top there are what it would represent if it existed today uh, with all other factors. So 18% uh, of, uh, of uh, housing units, uh, over 15% of our population, 22% of retail, uh, almost 15% of office space. 
and over 20% of industrial space would exist um, in that proposed mix. Again, uh, that's if the project just magically appeared today, um, what percentages it would represent. So for our part of the equation, we really wanted to take the market study and market forecast that they've created. Uh, we trust, but we wanted to verify. And so what we did is hired an independent consultant to sit uh, closely with their consultant te consulting team. He had full access to all of those studies and did issue an executive opinion to the council that documents available to the public. Uh, and essentially, he verified that uh, standard practices were followed. Uh, his big takeaway for me was that uh, the first 10 years are far easier to predict. No great surprise there. And that's in a real important point because uh, it really seems clearer to me that the sooner we can get them started in the right direction, the one that we prefer, uh, that's the best way to assure build-out will occur uh, ultimately in, in the fashion that we desire. So the, the analysis really uh, took up two different sides. One, we wanted to understand what sort of value could be created and therefore what sort of new tax revenue would be uh, created uh, and flow to the town. And secondly, what would it cost to, to serve the various development schemes? So this slide is intended to show uh, there's a lot of detailed analysis that backs this up, but uh, this intends to show uh, kind of answer that first question, what is, does a partnership make sense? So on the first uh, left-hand side, that's the analysis with the partnership, <coughs> the proposed build-out. Um, the estimate is that it would produce uh, 580 million or so uh, in total revenue over a 30-year period. Uh, our cost analysis suggests that it would be about 235 million to serve just the, the new demands created by uh, the Downs project. And so there would be a, uh, a net to the town, if you will, of uh, nearly $350 million. Um, that is to be compared to the no partnership option, which, as you might recall, a couple of slides ago, there was a graph that showed the two different lines. It had a lower trajectory, so it's a lower total value, about $250 million. Uh, not surprisingly, it's less cost for us to serve because there's less uh, development. Uh, and so the town uh, also nets out um, in a positive situation there. However, this analysis doesn't consider the credit enhancement agreement, which contemplates reimbursing a portion of those revenues back to the developer. And that obviously needs to be considered. Uh, just uh, on the margin on the left, it's worth noting that the difference between those two net numbers is uh, $230 million or so um, over the 30-year term. Tom, can I ask a question about that slide before you look? Is that, is that including inflation or? Yes. Yes, these are all inflated yes. dollars. Thank you. And, and Tom, point of clarity, I thought Steve Brin that did, he looked at the growth. He did not look at the cost estimates. Correct. It's, I beg your pardon. But, but, but you in, indicated that he did. He did not look at any of the financial modeling. He just looked at the growth. He looked at the market study and market forecast, correct. But, but nothing with the economic model. I just want to make sure that's correct. clear. Correct. Yeah, it, yeah, I beg your pardon. I thought I heard you say something different. So. Nope, I, if I did, I misstated. Uh, no, he looked solely at the market analysis okay. and the growth uh, assumptions that were made. So moving into the credit enhancement, the partnership piece, uh, these numbers will be familiar to you. Uh, there's the, the different revenue projections for the different <coughs> partnership and no partnership option. The cost to serve was on the prior slide. The big difference is, um, and we have assumed for purposes of this analysis, uh, that the developer will hit all of their marks and be eligible for full reimbursement and even maximize their bonus potential. And we estimate that to be $81 million. Jim Marie? Um, could you remind me what cost to serve means? What you're That's based our, on our analysis, based on the, uh, the timing and the type of development they propose. Uh, that's our cost to serve, uh, provide municipal services to okay. the developer. Which would include just for the purposes of the audience. So we focused on the big cost centers: public safety, public works, schools, uh, community service, and library. Thank you. And then, so obviously, with no partnership. There's no money flowing back, uh, so no money from the town. We keep all of it, and you'll see what the net difference is: uh, 265 million dollars for the partnership scenario, 117 million for the no partnership. Uh, for a difference between those two of nearly 150 million.
So rolling this all up, uh, essentially what this means, uh, the total revenue projected with the desired build-out scenario of 580 million, essentially 500 comes to us, or 86 percent. 14 percent flows to them by way of the credit enhancement agreement. Then considering the cost to provide service of 235, uh, that leaves the town with a balance of 265 million to do what it will with. Um, that 60, that that money uh, can be simply flow back to the general fund. Uh, we lose some shelter benefit, but that's not a huge consequence to us. Or we could, and I'd like to engage you in some conversation, choose to uh, allocate or dedicate some of those funds toward uh, uh, agreed upon projects within the uh, TIF district itself, and namely in the area of traffic congestion uh, management. We, we certainly have some challenges today, um, but that's a point that I'd like to bring uh, the council back to after, if we could. So very quickly on the credit enhancement for, uh, for the general public, um, there were a number of guiding principles that were developed, and that was really done through a series of uh, discussions I had um, and our legal counsel had with the town council, and they are as follows. The town, first and foremost, must benefit. Uh, that can't be stated enough. It, it's obvious that there's a benefit to the developer in these scenarios, uh, and frankly, uh, we shouldn't even consider it unless the town benefits uh, equally, if not first and foremost. Um, as was said earlier, there shall be no upfront uh, town investment whatsoever that uh, our contributions really ought to be focused on those elements uh, of public benefit and or extraordinary costs. There ought to be strict performance standards and there ought to be overall caps. So we have uh, a really good sense of, uh, of the deal that we're considering. Those guiding principles have kind of uh, emerged into uh, goals that we've developed at the staff level that I think marry very nicely with those principles. And it's all about affecting the mix uh, in pattern <coughs> with an eye toward reducing costs. It's really focusing on that ROI, which, where is the best situation? And it appears as though there, there can be a win-win, and we shouldn't be ashamed of that. Um, but first and foremost, uh, we need to focus on the town's needs first. Uh, as part of that, obviously, understand the potential cost to serve the different development types. Also find different ways to work with the downs and engage the community uh, uh, to uh, potentially achieve public policy goals, uh, whether it's the creation of a downtown or a town center, I'm not sure how you want to characterize it, uh, a theme that emerged very clearly in our comprehensive plan uh, and or a, a community center. And essentially the approach we've taken is that both those things need a lot more time. We need to engage the community um, uh, completely in those uh, different discussions to see if there's uh, interest in pursuing them further. And so, um, and, and finally, work with the Downs on achieving early success. As I mentioned earlier, I believe the best way to achieve uh, the desired development pattern is to get started off in the right direction. And there's some opportunity that is before, um, is well documented in the development community, and the down, Downs has, some, um, has made some efforts to, to really solidify some of those opportunities. So where it all comes down to, uh, this is a, a quick overview. There's more details available uh, on the town's website uh, if you want to dig deeper. But these, uh, this is the basic anatomy of the credit enhancement agreement. <coughs> there are specified reimbursement caps in two ways. One is uh, the initial reimbursement capped at 55 million. To the extent that they are eligible for a bonus period, there are annual caps of 2 million. There are strict performance measures really designed to assure that desired mix and pattern of development. Uh, the maximum re reimbursement rate is 40% if they meet their performance measures. Otherwise, it falls to 25%. There's a, uh, a specific cap on single-family dwellings of 750 units. The initial term is 20 years in duration. There's the potential for an extra 10 years um, for a good performance, meeting their marks. It also preserves op options uh, for those community-driven discussions regarding a town center and potentially a community center. And it requires uh, biannual reporting to the public. Uh, I presume that will happen through from this podium to the council, but the public will be able to take a, a measurement uh, pretty uh, consistently throughout the whole term. And so this is uh, how the reimbursements work. Uh, it's broken up into different segments. Uh, years 1 through 10, it's a 40% reimbursement of 
property taxes uh, paid, so value has to be created, taxes have to be paid, and then reimbursement occurs only at that time, and that's at a 40% rate. For years 15, 11 through 15, um, it is 25% if the standards aren't met. Um, if they are, then they stay at 40%. The same is true at the next increment of 16 to 20. And there's an overall cap uh, measured at 20, uh, overall cap of 55 million measured at the 20 year mark, <coughs> and I'll get into that just momentarily. And then should they be eligible for the bonus period, those final 10 years, um, the uh, prior percentages go away, it's strictly 10%, and it's capped on an annual basis, no more than 10 million, excuse me, 2 million per, per year. Beyond reimbursements, uh, the performance standards, really key ingredients, I believe, in this credit enhancement agreement. The first check-in is at year 10. Uh, they must uh, provide or produce at least 600,000 square feet of non-residential space and uh, have the infrastructure necessary to serve that, obviously. And that is really, uh, the, all, the other important part of that is to make sure that it's laid out in such a way that it preserves that town center option should we choose to do that. And we will have engaged uh, the community in the process well in advance of that to know whether that's a, a viable option for us. At year 15, <coughs> the check-in is producing at least 900,000 square feet of non-residential space and related infrastructure. And then at year 20, uh, there's a number of things that must be uh, reached. Uh, for them to be eligible for the bonus. One is they must maximize their initial cap um, at 55 million. They must also meet uh, 1.2 million in non-residential space. And only then would they be eligible for the bonus. Um, also, there's a, uh, as I mentioned, there's a cap on single family units, no more than 750. We have, uh, for purposes of discussion, excluded affordable and senior housing in that calculation. I'm interested in counselor comments in that regard, I suppose. And lastly, um, the other key ingredient are caps. As I mentioned, 55 million in the initial development and no more than two per year uh, in the bonus period. So we've, at the staff level, we found ourselves so caught up in the numbers and the negotiations around the credit enhancement agreement that frankly we've, we've lost sight a bit that uh, none of this can be even discussed without the development and the existence of a TIF district. So. Uh, let's not lose sight of that, and we want to make sure we cover a little of that territory tonight. So this is a slide you've seen before, but our concept is to um, uh, create a downtown district that would include generally the Oak Hill area, the municipal campus we're on right now, <coughs> um, Route 1 corridor, and the Downs property, all becoming one district. And, uh, and we see the opportunity not for uh, development Stand. on the Downs, Downs to replace what we already have, but it's really to complement, to make sure it's integrated with, and part of what uh, the great things that we already have. And we think there's some great opportunity there. So lastly, just a couple of things I want to leave you with. I, you have a ton of questions, I suspect, but the ultimate question, the $81 million question is, does a partnership make sense? Uh, that's the threshold question that needs to be answered. Uh, beyond that, um, if, if we do proceed in this fashion, we'd like to engage the council in some conversation around what do we do with uh, the portion of money that flows back to us? We haven't had that conversation. I'd like to suggest that we do dedicate a small portion, maybe 10% perhaps, uh, toward projects uh, that, that would occur within the TIF district itself and they'd be focused on transportation specific. And that's a point that uh, I'd like to get some feedback on. So with that, I. I think we'll open it up for questions, and I'm sure Rocky and his team are willing to engage as well. Happy to answer questions. So, Peter. Can we, um, on the broader question of the whole TIF, do I understand it's about a 1,000 acres that we're talking about, the whole downtown district? It wounds up being a little <clears> less than that. I think, we're, I think it's coming in about 800 acres. And, and what would be, with a full build-out, Scarborough Downs is in that district. Correct. With a full build-out and all the other properties that are there, what is that? That's about, it'll be about 800 million, 900 million of property? Um, I don't have that number for the, for the balance of the, um, for the district. So we need to work with the assessor to get that certified. Because I think that'd be important. <coughs> Absolutely. Because if I understand it right, that that whole area then, that will drive about 14 or 15 million dollars worth of tax revenue a year. 
I, I, it's only the increment created from this point in time forward. It's not the existing value. Right. Okay, but, the so I think what would be important for me to know would be what is that value that will fall underneath? Because I, as I understand it, and it's sort of what happened when we created the downtown TIF for back in the 80s when we went for town hall that got turned down at the polls twice. We created a downtown TIF and we use those monies to build town hall, which created a real issue for us. So do we have some parameters around for that money that is created within the broader TIF? Well, that all that money, all that incremental value becomes a decision of the town council rather than the public, right? Correct. Part. To the extent that you don't want it to flow back, shelter it, and you don't want it to flow back to general fund for general purposes and use it for another qualified reason, but that's we could a decision. Like, like an ice rink if we wanted to well, fund an ice rink. Well, there's very, very specific guidelines, and, and many of those loopholes, uh, like funding a town hall, have been closed up through the years. So there's But I'd be real concerned. Is there some way, I mean, when are we going to talk about can we structure that deal so that it's not just the decision of the town council on how to spend that incremental value, which can be millions per year, that the town, the public, still has some say in how those funds are used. Well, as part of the development program, <clears throat> if we wish to dedicate certain portion of that money, that, that's a decision that will need to be made as part of the creation of the TIF district. You can amend it in the future if you wish to change that percentage or broaden its use, uh, but those are decisions that need to be made. By the town council. Yes. So it kind of, that's a piece of the pie that comes out of sort of the public mm -hmm. decision-making mm -hmm. domain. I just think that's that's important to know. It'd be important to know what that number is. Sure. We, I and just, and it, it, right. we should have that by now, because that's going to be, that's part of the conversation. I don't know. Um, and then two, my bigger question would be then, so in the other issue, you've talked about tax sheltering, but as I understand it, most communities that do TIFs, there's huge tax sheltering because of the school funding. Mm -hmm which is worth about 45 cents on the dollar. We don't get that here because of a minimum receivership. There's some tax sheltering for the Cumberland tax, which is 5%. Mm -hmm. But whatever monies come back to the general fund, there's no sheltering. Is that correct? Correct. Revenue right. share. 5% sheltering. Not if it comes in. Not if it goes back to the right. public. Right. And no, that would be true of anybody. Well, oh, I know, but, I, but, that, yeah. but that changes the economics. And, right. that, and that assumes that the state legislature stays the status quo of not funding right. education in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. Right. That's an assumption. There's revenue share there as well. The state revenue right. share yeah, is also shielding. But yeah. am I correct that if it, no matter whether you're a minimum receiver or not, if it goes back to the general fund, you lose the right. shelter. You lose so, the sheltering ability. We do. Right. All right. But, but it doesn't. The only thing we can shelter right now, as I understand it, unless, as Sean points out, there's some changes, is the five percent. It doesn't help us with school funding at this point. Is it any monies that stay in the uh, TIF district in a, as a reserve fund, not in the general fund, that gets a 5% <coughs> boost? Right. 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 You said that, yeah. Right. right. We're in agreement. It doesn't for schools. You're right. But, but it gets dedicated to the projects that you identify that you want to complete. Should you wish well, to. Like traffic. You have all of including format. traffic improvements. Well, that, yeah. that was sort of my other question about when they, the, the, the document you handed out suggested that if you create this, there should be very clear goals about the money would be used for, and very clear guidelines right. about how we're going to allocate those monies. I, mean, I don't know when that work is done. I think we'd want to do that work before we make a decision to do it. So I don't know how that fits in our schedule. And, and I think that's why I put it here to make sure we can at least start that conversation. We've, the credit enhancement conversation has kind of consumed the, the, the time and attention, frankly, but that's a critical point that needs to be worked through. The other thing I would just say, and finally in that, in that vein, um, because of the way this is set up, we know we're going to be re-engaging in, within the next four years. And so there will be an opportunity. Maybe it's best to take a pass on those other issues now and have additional time to, to work that through. That's an option as well. What do you mean? Couldn't the decision-making of the council 5, 10, 15 years from now be completely different from anything we judge now? Sure. And, they'd be able to and they would be able to control that. Including decision. reopening the CEA and, and negotiating completely different standards. And using the money for uh, the public fund yes. as opposed to some project we might think of now. Yes, and that's with totally within the control of control the town. With respect to the CEA, that's a deal that's bilateral. We can't do that unilaterally. But... Um, for the portion of uh, revenues that we control, that's a town control decision, however we choose to do that. 
Jane Marie. I have three separate sort of nitty gritty questions that the developer may be able to answer. Okay. Um, one of them is if, you know, there was no such thing as tips or credit enhancement and whatever. What do you, have you done the numbers on how much it would cost to extend the utilities to your property line? In other words, the cost that would be borne by the town, so to speak, to, to pull sewer, pull whatever, at least to, to your property line. On Route 1? Well, the, or in any, anywhere within the development. Has the town will never bear any cost. No, I'm, but what I'm saying extend. is theoretically what I'm trying to establish is there's, there's a benefit to the town of having you do it because it's going to cost the town to do it. Right. There's, there's cost. You know cost what that cost that. is? So, so we think on, on our master <coughs> plan, our numbers show $265 million in, in ultimate build-out. If, I know. If we achieve the master But I'm plan. just asking specifically utilities, and you may not have that number. I don't have that number okay. off the top of my head. But I'm going down the right road, right? That if the, the town would have that, and I'm going to ask this to the manager, that in order to have Scarborough Downs do any development there, the town, at least if the developer didn't, may be responsible for some... As a, as a general rule, we, we don't typically in, invest in infrastructure. Our last right. example in a big way is Highest <laughs> Parkway, and perhaps we've learned a lesson there. Right. So I, I would dare say that we probably wouldn't be doing that. The, uh, the consequence is the land simply sits fallow. Right. It doesn't get developed. Right. Okay. My, my next question has to do with, um, this is something that came up in some emails that was, I thought it was an interesting question, sewer capacity. I should know the answer to that, but I don't. Who pays for that? Is that a developer paid in a normal development? I mean, that, is that part of that? That's on us. We're going to be paying over $10 million, uh, okay. 10 to $12 million in sewer impact fees. So every time we build a residential house, there's a certain fee. Right. I think it's a little over $3,000. Uh, if it's commercial, we get charged per gallon. Yep. So the, the Scarborough Sanitary District has done a very good job over the years of collecting those funds so that when they do an expansion of their plant, uh, that burden doesn't typically get loaded onto the onto the uh, user. Yeah, and I it's, figured that I just couldn't remember what the oh, Has there been a discussion with the Scarborough Sanitary District about their ability to keep up with the growth that is anticipated? There's been some general uh, discussion about that because we're taking this a bite at a time and it's a 20-year project. Um, so, you know, our first phase, we know there's plenty of capacity there. We just pay the fee and we can go. We believe the second phase, uh, which would be the light industrial, is, is the same uh, with that. But we'll be continuing continuing to work with them over time uh, to be sure that the capacity is there. But they, they've got quite a lot of capacity right now. And, and have they raised any red flags with you uh, in, in the course of your discussions? I would say they, they have not. They want to be kept informed. Uh, they want to be, you know, they want to be up on the wheel, if you will, and make sure that they don't, yeah. we don't get into a situation where they can't service us. Uh -huh. uh, but our, our fees are being paid. As we pull a building permit, we pay that fee. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a substantial amount right. of money. Just and then my last question, I'm sorry. I was say, not only will there be reserve, capacity reserve fees paid, but there will also be all the cost of laying the sewer line, oh, absolutely. pump stations, we, all of that is. Oh, right. We bear right. all of the cost of the right. actual physical right. installation of the sewer system, including right. pump stations and, right. and whatnot. But on top of that, we pay a fee to be able to. And I think it's important for the general public to hear mm -hmm. that. Um, and then my last question, I was asked this evening by someone who's in the audience, and I couldn't answer it, and I'm just going to throw it out there because it was an interesting question. Um, so we build, we, we do construction, we do development, people start moving into houses and the residential in particular. At what point does the town accept the street, and when does it become the town's job to plow the streets as opposed to the developer? So uh, typically, that is, there's a couple of, couple of things that come into play. The, um, we have to have the road built to the town standards right. and complete, and right. we have to have gone through the inspection uh, with the town to, to have them agree that, yes, it's been built to their standards. Um, in the residential piece, we typically try to um, get to a point where we get a base road in, get base coat down, get some construction done, get some people in there, get them living there, and then get the final coat of pavement. The, the longer we can hold off on the final coat, oh, right. the better road the town gets right. in the end. So there's, there's a little bit of a, you know, a juggling act there. Okay. But uh, typically, you know, the road doesn't get accepted by the town until there's a substantial amount of completion done and people living there. Thank you. That was a question that came from someone. Sure. Yeah. 
So I have a follow-up question, and I was wondering, is it possible to go back a page or two to show a, a follow-up question regarding the, uh, the road issue? Um, so I've been here long enough to know that some developers in the past have also built roads that are non-conforming, and then later on, 20 years down the line, they come before us being asked to be accepted because they can't be managed anymore. Are all the roads going to be built conforming? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, we've got to meet all the requirements of, yeah. the, of the zoning ordinance. Uh, most of our roads would be public. Uh, in the light industrial area, we do have some uh, private ways yeah. that will be built. Uh, but the truth is, those actually will meet public standards. Okay. Uh, but the intention wouldn't be to have the town accept <clears throat> those. That would be held by okay. the association. So, and before, and so just one follow-up. And by the way, I did want to mention, I apologize for being late. I got stuck in Boston. Um, so the two follow-up questions I have is that the timeline regarding the square footage on the non on the commercial non-residential space, the initial projections are planned called for a total of 1.8 million dollars, but yet the plan takes you out to 20 years at 1.2. What happened to the remaining 600,000 square feet? In the, is that at 30 years? So that's between oh, year 20 and 30. 30. Uh, no, is that right? No, it's 20 years. 20 years. Yes, you're building full at at 20 years. So okay, is that at 1.2 right. or at the 1.8 that was stated in the proposal that we were given? So our numbers show a full build out at 20 years. At 1.2? or no, at the higher number. At, at 1.6, mm -hmm. okay. But yet our agreement says you only have to be at 1.2 in order correct. to receive your regular payments as well as any of the bonuses. That's correct. Okay. I still need to get my hands around why we have that as an incentive because um, I would think it would have to match up. The incentive is after you have met what you've projected, Front but we can talk about locked. that. So the last question I have, sorry, the last question I have is, what is the maximum number of single family units that could be built on this property without this agreement? So that's a tough question to answer. Um, we're allowed to have about 4,000 residential dwelling units there, but in order to actually achieve that, you know, a good portion would be multifamily. Yeah. Um, Dan, you had a quick number, I think the other day, of, of I believe around a couple thousand uh, houses. You know, what you zone, think of as a... The zone allows 20 units per acre. 20 units okay. per acre. And there's 300 acres of uh, upland, developable land. Um, the zone expects some amount of a mix of a project. It can't mm -hmm. all be single-family homes, but it, you know, the majority could be single-family and there could be some commercial. So, so it sounds like 4,000 could be a reasonable yeah, number. Yeah, 4,000 is reasonable. Rather than 750. 750 is a, is a big drop in what, okay. what could get done. This I just wanted to make sure on, that was clear. But on the 4,000 the other night, you said a, you, <coughs> you said something which I didn't follow. With with 135 housing permits, is sort of like growth permits, and in order to get the 4,000, you'd have to have some exceptions from, could you build the 4,000 with 135 permits per year? Probably not. not right. well, so you could would, eventually. So, so that there would be the current growth ordinances put mm -hmm. some dampers on that 4,000. The right. only way you could get to 4,000 is you'd have to come before the council to get overrides or additional permits, right? <coughs> or the so, or, or, or build out closer for 30 years. You could, but it would, but it, it'd be what? Yeah. yeah. Or the build out's longer, right? Or well, the build out's longer. The build out could be right. 40 years. I think the instead. issues that are created by that large scale residential still would exist. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The issue of uh, the yeah. growth permits uh, is one that I think the town's going to have to take up regardless of this. Yeah. Uh, the entire development community is asking questions. Jay can speak to it better than me. I think we need to get through the uh, comprehensive plan, but I expect it's a discussion we need to have as a community Katie. sooner than later. Um, so I think most people at this table and in the audience and the community would agree making projections on 30 years is hard. more than hard. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, we're doing absolutely the best that we can. Um, so, I, and I know this was part of our discussion, it's kind of one of those after the facts, it's not part of the current uh, agreement that's on the table being proposed, but I think the conversation continued and I don't know that we got an answer around the idea that let's say we hit year eight or nine and we have realized we now have 700 students there instead of 350 or whatever the projections were. If we've doubled that and now all of a sudden the community is looking at us going, we need new school. Have you considered adding into the agreement, or has this been part of the conversation, land also being uh, made available for that potentiality? Uh, that has not been part 
of the negotiation, although that's not the first time. Peter and I just heard it out in the hallway. Yeah. Uh, we hear that. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a school big concern for people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to be very cautious about this. Coming from the school board side of things, I, I'm very hesitant to put all of these options on the table because we just don't really know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we're going to be facing a situation with the, with the neighborhood schools no matter what, whether this develops or not. That's going to be a, a, an issue we're going to have to address, period. So whether this moves forward or not, that's going to be something that's going to come down the pike. Um, so I, I, I prefer not to, to look at it that way because uh, I'm not looking at the numbers for six years. I'm not convinced that building another neighborhood school might necessarily be the answer. Um, so I'd rather not mix apples and oranges at this point. I think that's, that's in my opinion, I just know as part of orange. our discussion, I just wondered if yeah. that had been broached to those guys and if... And no. it's even being considered. That's another, another way to think about that might be that we have time to, obviously with the build-out schedule, to review what would go in downtown. You know, there's, there's talk of a downtown center, there's talk of a community center, so there's land for that, if you will. Um, that land is essentially in a, I'd say an informal reserve um, that, you know, as, as that stuff gets worked out with the, with the growth that's coming regardless of what we do, um, you know, that's certainly a conversation that Could be se seems to be, you know, seems a need to, to uh, get engaged over, for sure. Katie, anything? No, that, that was that. Further questions? Well, yeah. Uh, Tom, you, you said there were limitations on what could be used for, with the TIF funds. My understanding was that there was a scenario under which some of those funds could be used for a community center. Could you speak to that at all? Yeah, it, that's the reason, one of the reasons we're choosing to go the downtown TIF route. Um, by our analysis under the TIF statute, um, that's the only situation under which we could even consider that option. And even then, I think it needs to be very carefully considered. Uh, but there is a scenario that uh, we've worked with legal counsel that, that that's a possibility. That's not the only reason we propose the downtown approach, but um, a primary one. Gotcha. Um, Thank you. Um, so, given given that, I have, so my understanding of the agree, agreement is that we have a, a four year option on uh, on both the downtown concept and the community center. Is that right? I'm, yeah. With respect to the community center, it's a little tighter than that in that they've actually reserving space for us. The downtown is more of a conversation that we need to have as a community to get back to them and participate with them. It's not going to be in isolation, I, ex I expect, but we want to engage the community to see what elements, if any, uh, make sense to us. And it contemplates maybe further partnership if certain things are really attractive, but that's to we be decided seen. in the future. So my, I guess my concern with that was just around the, the timeline. Things can have a tendency to move slowly uh, <laughs> in general. I'm wondering if there's any way to have that extend it to give a little bit more time um, to the community. Um, another um, one thing that I'm curious about is, did we consider caps on all residential in terms of, so we've got the 750 single family units, but I'm wondering about also some kind of cap. I think the full build out showed something like 2,000 um, housing units. I'm wondering also about capping that to kind of, again, kind of remove some of the downside risk. Um, I think just, just to answer that, uh, the return on investment analysis uh, showed that uh, there was a, a much, much better return on investment for other forms of housing than there is for single-family residential housing. Single-family residential housing uh, runs the risk of actually costing the town money. Uh, after the taxes are collected, you've spent more than the taxes were. Uh, none of the other forms of housing fell into that category. And but Sorry, and that's sorry, but you still have the, the issues of traffic and school and that as well that, that could potentially be avoided, even though even if we went, would have a positive ROI. That took into account the impact. Not the impact of the capital costs, but right. um, or or if they were but the, the be, service costs. But the operating cost costs was taken yeah. into account, yeah. and it still was a net positive for everything except single-family detached dwellings. Gotcha, and then. Sorry, to continue. My, my understanding is that, uh, you know, we're talking about those, the, the numbers, either 81 million or, or 55 million. Those are in uh, today's dollars, but paid back over you know, third, 20 and 30 years. I wonder if we've done any kind of um, net present value analysis of... Right. So, so those, um, 
those are the because we we've negotiated them as as that's the the maximum you can get. So we we didn't do any further um, cost inflators or anything like that. It's like <coughs> Fifty five million is whenever they hit that, whatever year they hit that in. That's what that's as much as they can get. Um, so over time, sure the the. Fifty-five million is probably if they if they hit it in year twenty, it's the not worth fifty-five of, million in year one. So, but we haven't run that number of um, what it's going to cost them right. to put off. Well, that, that's essentially what it would cost us. So, if we were if right. we were to be if we were talking if we were borrowing the money, we'd have to borrow. Let's go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to confuse the fact though. What you know, this is all relevant to the amount of taxes we're collecting. So, if they get to fifty-five million earlier, that's good for us. Because we've got more revenue now in the bank, regardless of what they're doing. No, my, my point is that $55 million 20 years from now is not the same as $55 million right. Right. today. It's, it's right. less. It's, well, a lot, it's, a, it's significantly less. Yeah. <laughs> so we're talking about $55 million is the number. Right. Uh, so, but you're paying it out in years 1 through 20. So at year 20, that the dollar that you're paying out right. might worth. be worth... Fifty cents. Right. So, so I would say. Don't give many ideas. That's the that's the incentive <laughs> for them to build out <laughs> faster, for us to receive more revenue faster, so that they can receive the real fifty-five million faster, versus waiting for twenty yes. or twenty-five years to get that payout. Because fifteen million in fifteen years is a heck of a lot more than fifteen million in twenty or twenty twenty years. Right? When you think about yeah, an MPV, you'd, you'd need an offset on our side to keep a dollar right square, if you right. will. Right. So you need it on both ends, and we just thought. Leaving it static would, would uh, every all the, the boat would rise, Keep collectively. Simple. Sorry, uh, one, other one, questions. One, one follow. -up. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to to include to specify. So you said the land was on reserve. Is that? I mean, I would assume that that would be that would be part of the agreement. Would be the land for a community center. It wouldn't be something we'd then be purchasing at a later date. Or is uh, that? And we've characterized it as kind of an option on it. Uh, yeah, okay. We haven't talked really any further than that, but. Uh, there, there's a spot on the face of the earth for that building. Okay, thank you. Peter. Yeah, just, just kind of a quick question. Um, <clears throat> this is a report that came from Merriman. It says, analyzing over 30 studies on the impact of tax increment financing or TIF has had on communities across the country. Merriman found that the practice often fails <clears throat> to deliver economic growth beyond what otherwise would have occurred and is likely to zip a result of the relocation of economic activity rather than creation. My only question is, when we did the economic modeling, because I used to run a lot of the acquisition work for Hannaford, you do a sensitivity to analysis. You kind of say, what if some of these assumptions don't play out? Did we, did we play any of that out? If, 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 if the economic activity, especially the non-residential, is different than what has been laid out, do we know the impact on our ROI? No, we've, we've modeled and looked at um, this particular scenario. And then we certainly had the market analysis that says it's a reasonable scenario to move forward. Well, so I, we've not looked at, we've not looked at um, whether or not the <coughs> development is 10% more or 10% less. But, but I would guess, and I guess I read that analysis a little differently, saying for 10 years the numbers mm -hmm. are pretty solid. Yep. After 10 years, just as we've said, it's kind of a roll of the dice. No one mm -hmm. can really predict. Yep. And so I think what people are asking for is, what is the range, what is the risk reward? What, we, what we're showing is the reward. This, this could be a really good example. The risk would be, what if the numbers don't play out? And if we don't know them, it's hard to then. Well, the one, the one thing I would say, I think that's why we were so conservative with the approach on how much we were willing to um, talk about over the life of the TIF. And so, um, you know, right now with projected values, which there are tons of assumptions, there are tons of assumptions in there, we're still 15% um, in the credit enhancement agreement and 85% in our control. So we've got some cushion in there um, in terms of what's, what can happen. But the other piece of that is if the, if the value is not created, then the um, value of that credit enhancement agreement drops. It, it doesn't so, exist. Right. Right. And, right. and what I would say is one of the things you know we, we did do is, remember originally we started out looking at this in <coughs> absolute flat dollars. And let's take out all the you know, 
projections of inflation rates and all of um, tax rates and all of that, even if we kept $2,018 and we kept the tax rate flat, if they build out the way that they've talked about, um, they would hit a maximum of $49 million at year 20 in terms of, of where they would get in terms of the um, credit analysis. And so that really becomes, that's like 22% of the amount of revenue, net new revenue that we're creating. Chris. I know, it's so many numbers, but. Right. So I have a question. So, so what? I mean, and I, I, and I say that with kind of tongue in cheek. Uh, d does it really matter the growth rate? Because it's not like we're investing capital up front and expecting an ROI with a certain time period. We don't, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, we don't get paid a dime until this starts generating tax revenue. And once it starts generating tax revenue, for every dollar that we get, we're paying them back 40 cents or 22 cents or whatever that rep range is, depending on where they're at in the, in the credit history. If we don't get that dollar, they don't get anything. Is, we, that, is that fair? No, but, but we don't know is what's wait, 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 Is that fair? No, it's not fair. That's not, fair. That's not the way the agreement is structured? Because that's, that's my understanding of how the agreement is structured. No, it, it, the way the agreement is structured is what, what we don't know. What is our cost of providing services given well, different we, scenarios? We do know that because we've, 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 we've made an estimate. Front analysis we've made a projection. We, well, that gets back to the earlier question. We have the only people that have seen those detailed numbers is it has not gone out to us uh, financial planners or <coughs> that we had we had, we had agreed to an independent financial audit that hasn't been done. I thought so, we agreed to an independent evaluation of the of the market. Well, an independent the, of, of the and market. finances of the market. and but, finances. But, the Peter's the asking if we're going to do one yeah. on the cost side. Now, yes. we, in the SEDCO director, we have a person with tremendous experience in that, but we also have... Right. We're, we're, we've been running numbers up until last week because we ran a new scenario um, last week even um, on that, on the um, um, alternative scenario. So, um, and we're crunching them as fast as we're being, uh, trying to, to keep up with it. But I think we're ready now to talk with... Um, a financial person to go ahead and check the numbers and look through them again. So, so I just, I'm sorry, I just want to be clear. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, you, you, I, I, it's important Sorry. because I, I want to understand the basis you, of this agreement. You, thank you. I want to understand the basis of this agreement. Is, is it or is it not accurate to say that we don't pay out anything until we get paid? Because I heard Councillor Hayes say, no, that's not the case. I just want to be clear that I understand that that is the case. It, that is the case. It is the case. That is the case. Right. Right. And so if the okay. project does poorly, the, the developer gets a lot less money. Okay, that's fine. That's, that was uh, my understanding. I just wanted, I wanted that clarity. Because you kind of have two things going. You got revenue generation we're talking about and then cost. I, I understand. That's I understand. Those are the two buckets. Well, the third, the the third thing you have, if we don't have enough revenue left over after paying out your share, it gets transferred to taxpayers. That's the real And that's issue. why we've done the analysis that we have to demonstrate that uh, it's a very good deal. But for the town, Bill, Bill and, and this is and I have, what I you're saying asked, is, well, didn't the we numbers. Buy this, didn't we buy this tool? I mean, this we is did. something consultants. Right. So, but, but, it has, but I've asked for the numbers for for two weeks now. I've asked six times, and I've been told that the numbers will get the detailed sheets. I have yet to see them. I've been promised them four times. I have not seen the underlying numbers to say, gee. Right. Well, we have seen we have seen some numbers. We haven't seen the new right. numbers that they're using to run all of this. So and, and if everybody should see those. I think everybody would be much more comfortable uh, and, if right. we and, saw. And just if, if I can address that. So we talked last week, and my bad, I'm running out of time for, for uh, doing things. What I needed to do, there were two things that we talked about because we had a conversation last week. So there are two things that we talked about. One was um, understanding the equivalent scenario, the lower... Uh, no development partner. scenario in in terms of the way we projected it so we we did do that last week um, mm -hmm. and then um, I have created an additional table that shows the ROI and the details and we've talked but some of that had some uh, proprietary information in it <clears throat> so we've talked with Rocky we can now let that go so I have those tables prepared and we can release those um, tomorrow. They need some additional explanation so people understand what they are. But we've, we've done the work and um, I think they've been cleaned up to 
um, everyone's satisfaction. But so we'll release them tomorrow. Katie. And I, and this is important for me because I, I feel like in some ways I'm hearing different pieces from different people and I want to make sure that we all have the same understanding because I was of the understanding um, and not to say that I'm right or, or someone else is wrong that we were doing both the market a third person market analysis and a third person financial uh, analysis as well and it's not because I do not believe that what the beautiful and wonderful Karen Martin has done is inaccurate but I think with a project of this scope the more people that we can make confident and comfortable with all of the numbers, the better. Mm -hmm. I think huge strides have been made just by slowing it down a little bit the past couple of weeks by doing the public outreach sessions. Uh, I think we're get going in the right direction. So why would we not do that all the way through now? That's that's kind of where I feel. And I, and you said, Karen, my bad. I, I have to say, for me, it's not your bad. <laughs> Our, because our town has, and it's not a limited capacity in your intellect or ability, it's just time. time. Like, like, we all have <laughs> to sleep and eat uh, and sometimes have a little bit of a life. Um, and just because <laughs> no, we... No, we give it up some of those things. <laughs> well, me too. But, you know, just because we are limited uh, in our ability to do it as fast as you guys want to, and I, it's not against you either, but we've got to be in this, a true partnership is going to understand that. That our capacity to, to keep up with you, um, we, there's got to be some give and take. So that's kind of where I am at. If, if we could be 100% certain that everything on the table right now and where we got to, although I would have liked to have reserved land for our school potentially, um, then I think a lot more people could be comfortable. But to get there, it's going to take us a little bit longer. To, to answer your question, I'm going to ask the town manager. To yeah, speak we, we are that. committed. I uh, made contact back with the consultant that produced this uh, cost model that uh, Karen has been working with. We've made some modifications. We think there are actually improvements to it, and uh, we think there's no one better than the one that created the model to really weigh in on uh, and comment on the modifications we've made and the appropriateness of those changes. Uh, we think it's an improvement, frankly, and um, more accurately reflect uh, expected costs. Good. Uh, we're past the <coughs> 7 o'clock start time for the regular town council meeting. I'm going to bring the workshop uh, to a close and advise all of those in the audience who would like to be able to <coughs> make comments that we're going to afford everyone the opportunity to do that. We have uh, an um, agenda item of setting an, uh, a, public, a public hearing, another public session on this, where we have several uh, uh, information sessions scheduled uh, in the next week two or, or two. Yep. October 9th, October 15th. Uh, uh, but then we'll also be back uh, uh, later in the month with another public session, which will be, uh, again, the opportunity for the public to ask questions and make comments. Uh, but that opportunity will be presented as we go forward with the regular meeting, and I'll explain that when we uh, call that meeting into order. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Before you adjourn, I just would like to say I'm having a public informational meeting tomorrow night, seven o'clock, Wentworth School. Please come. Great. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Good boy.
Um, the uh, meeting back to order. This is the uh, regular Scarborough Town Council meeting on Wednesday, October 3rd, 2018. We're running a little bit late. It's supposed to start at 7. Uh, and I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask everyone to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Cadrina? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Babine? Present. Chairman Donovan? Here. Uh, uh, next item on the agenda is general public comments. Uh, those here to speak on the Scarborough Downs who came for the, uh, for the workshop, uh, I plan to accept uh, any comments that people want to make on Scarborough Downs, and we are going to make an effort, uh, even if we can't, uh, as a part of, of that uh, public comment period, uh, answer all of your questions. Uh, it would be our intention to have the questions noted and try to uh, get back to everyone who asks questions with, with an answer. Uh, I'd also like to uh, take, uh, I know people came for the 6 o'clock meeting. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, we're getting some active interest in the Scarborough Downs project, which is good. It means that the public's becoming more and more informed which is an important goal that we have. Uh, what I'd like to do without objection is move uh, uh, order 18-70, which is the Scarborough Downs relevant matter on the agenda tonight, uh, to the first order of new business, so that those who came at 6 o'clock would be able to provide us their input uh, uh, without having to wait through the rest of the meeting. So uh, if that's uh, acceptable, that will be the way in which we'll proceed. Uh, general public comments. Uh, anyone wishing to make a general public comment on a matter that is not on the agenda, please approach the podium. And you have three minutes. State your name and address. Thank you. My name is Mike Doyle. I live in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I'm here as a reporter for FalmouthToday.me. Uh, reliable sources have come forward and made very serious allegations against uh, certain members of the police department. And I'm here tonight to request that Mr. Donovan and Mr. Hall institute an FBI investigation and a polygraph testing of these people. My sources are willing to sign sworn affidavits and give testimony in court to these facts. Uh, I'm told that a police officer seriously beat one of his children and then also beat his wife and one of the command uh, people at the police department uh, deleted the call for, excuse me, call for help for the wife, uh, had the uh, audio part deleted from the system, and had the uh, actual call sheet involved where they keep records for these shredded. And the uh, police officer who beat the child severely enough so when he went to school, people thought he'd been in a car accident, was the chief of police. He's also the same person who beat his wife at the time. And the person, I'm told, that shredded the uh, police record and deleted the audio is Captain Marla St. Pierre. So based on current uh, standards in the United States Senate, if they don't submit to a FBI investigation or a polygraph, apparently based on the current standard at the Judiciary Committee, they're guilty of these things. So here's a chance for them to clear their names, submit to an investigation, take a polygraph. Either it'll show that they're innocent or it'll show that they're guilty. But I'm asking both the leadership here, the town manager, and Mr. Donovan, the chairman, to initiate this investigation forthwith. Uh, these are serious charges of domestic violence. And the police officer on the way to the wife beating was ordered by uh, the command structure not to go to the house because it was the chief's house. And that's a violation of state law, and she also destroyed public uh, documents. These are very serious charges. And I hope the uh, town will take uh, steps to investigate this. Thank you. Next, anyone wishing to speak, please approach the podium. Uh, Dave Merrill, 29 J. Mill Road, Scarborough. 
Uh, I'm coming, I'm here uh, to passionately support the Downs Project, speaking on an agenda item if I could. Um, I have been a member of the... Uh, could you reserve your comments to the, uh, when we take up the Downs item? Be about five minutes. If that works, sure. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Good evening, Benjamin Howard, 4 Oakdale Drive. Tonight I am here to speak on the sign ordinance and more specifically the section regarding the uh, seven intersections at which they are banned from 50 feet of the light. Uh, the, this is a the sign ordinance is on the agenda. Oh, uh, would, my apologies. Would you reserve your comments yep. for, that, for that item? Thank you, Ben. Good evening, Chef Bolino, 5 Winmore Drive. Uh, I'd like to make a few comments about the Downs uh, project. We're going to, we, the, you're the, going to have the opportunity okay. to do that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Susan Hamill, and um, I live on Bay Street. I'm not going to be talking about the Downs. <laughs> I'm talking about growth, um, growth in the town. And we know it's going to happen, but... Um, in 19, from 1990 to 2002, Scarborough added 2,000 housing units. And um, I've talked about this before. At that time, at just the schools, we, we added portables. We couldn't keep up with what was going on. We, we, that's when we wrote the, gro the growth ordinance. So in December, and everything went fine. We had an economic downturn in 2008. We never really hit the limits of, of growth for several years. And then December 2016, Divine Capital came um, to build their 288 unit apartment complex and um, needed additional um, growth, growth permits. So we added 285 permits to the 215 that we had in the reserve pool. And since then, if you go through all the planning board um, uh, meetings and agendas, you'll see that um, there's a lot in the pipeline right now. There's about 1,000 units that are in various stages of, um, of building. And, and then we're going to be, we're also talking about a bigger project. Um, but we haven't really stepped back and said, how much growth do we want? How much can we stand? And how fast um, should it happen? And I'm, I think that it's time that um, we take that. You know, we looked at it back uh, when Divine Capital came. That was almost two years ago. Time to stop for a minute and let's talk and, uh, as a community and see where we are and where we want to go. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the council? Close the public comment period. Uh, Item five minutes of September 19, 2018. I'll accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Any comments or corrections? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous, thank you. Uh, treasurer's warrants are the only items to be signed this evening. I have already signed them. Uh, uh, order 1866 is the 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the renewal requests for junkyard permits pursuant to Title 30A. MRSA Chapter 182, Goldstein Steel Company, Inc., located at 36 Running Hill Road, A. Gagnon, or E. Perry Iron and Metal, located at Rigby Road, and Speedway Auto, located at 343 Payne Road. And I'd ask the Assistant Town Clerk to uh, fill us in on whether there's any issues that have been raised no in issue. the Clerk's Office. No, no issues. Everyone's been paid, and uh, codes and planning has done their inspection, and everything's okay. Very good. Uh, public hearing. Anyone wishing to address these issues, please approach the podium. Close the public hearing. I'll accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Discussion. Comments? Discussion? Pretty straightforward. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, all business. Order 18-29, second reading on the proposed Fifth Amendment to Contract Zone 1. Frank R. Goodwin, e &F Limited Liability Company, and Raymond C. Field. This is the Land Rover dealership located at 371 U.S. Route 1. And who do we have for... Well, Jay Chase is here, but Will Conway is here representing the, uh, 
the uh, applicant. If uh, would the council like to hear a presentation of sorts, or, or are you pretty good with this? As I recall, short? ladies and gentlemen, this is a matter involving a purchase of a property directly behind yes. the facility. Uh, did not raise a lot of comment or question mm -hmm. in the first reading or public hearing. So uh, I, I had questions actually. Uh, so what I would like to do is uh, give the public the opportunity, give, limiting the introduction to, to that level, uh, give the public the opportunity to speak to it. Anyone in the audience wishing to address this matter, please approach the podium. Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Uh, I see where this, this uh, application or this, this change came about last spring, so it's been about six months. I was, like, I guess, at the first reading of it. Uh, it looked, appeared to be raw land behind the dealership that they wanted to expand into. That apparently, they've been very successful over the years, and they just needed more space. They certainly provide good jobs with the technicians and the sales folks. So I don't know where this stands. I, hopefully, it's, it's on the way to be an approval. I don't know if that's what our reading is for tonight or not, but I certainly hope that that's the case. Uh, it is uh, a second reading, so that it is up for a final vote. You are correct. Other comments from the public? Seeing none, close out, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. Chiazzo. So I had some questions initially in the first phase about permeability and the amount of impermeable surface uh, allowable in that parcel, both as before, as a uh, before zone, I think it's originally as right now, and how it relates to the new contract zone. Has any of that been reviewed or looked at? Jay Chase is our uh, town planner, yep. and asked Jay to address the question. Sure. Um, so I can speak to that, that um, stormwater impervious surface is certainly something that the planning board looks at through their site plan review process. Um, I would say that the impervious uh, that's being proposed, the parking lot that's being proposed, is um, no different than any, you know, if the, if the lot had been developed, and, and frankly it might be a little bit less than had the lot been developed with a traditional building and associated parking facility um, as it would be allowed in the Haggis Parkway zone, which is the zone that it's actually in. Uh, Mr. Chase, uh, Planning Board took this up. Was there any commentary that the Council should be aware of? Um, again, they've uh, provided their preliminary approval, um, and uh, there, there weren't any um, suggestions that came directly to Council. There were certainly some things that Planning Board want to see the applicant work on um, before they come back. So just as part of the process, maybe what I should do is step back. Uh, as part of this contract zone process, in addition to it coming to council, the planning board does their preliminary site plan review, and then after council uh, makes their final action, it comes back to planning board for final review. So there are some details in the stormwater analysis, or actually the stormwater design that the board's asked the applicant to look at, but they aren't elements that actually need to be baked into the contract zone. They're components of the existing site plan review ordinance that the board already has the authority to review on. Um, so in that regard, yes, there's additional work to be done, but the board didn't have any direct comments for council. Thank you. Any questions of uh, Jay Chase? Yeah, so again, my understanding is um, if we do extend the contract zone to this particular parcel, the B4 zone doesn't matter. So whatever we put in the contract zone is what is, what is applicable, correct? Uh, so the language, um, and I apologize, I don't have it before me, but typically what it says is the language will say that the, the existing underlying zoning still prevails, but for sort of the additional allowances granted by the contract zone. Um, which in this instance would be more restrictive. Which in this instance would be more. Because you're saying that, that they're actually asking for less, uh, 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 less uh, coverage than they would if they could just build on it as a before. Um, correct, right, they, they haven't met their, so we do have sort of in, impervious coverage standards and they aren't meeting that threshold. Um, yeah. Councilor Rowan. Um, could you clarify the zone that that, that lot is currently yeah. in? My understanding is it's in the Haggis Park Parkway right? zone. Not, not B4. Right. I thought I saw something in the application that said it's current B3 or B4. That might be the frontage, the, 
uh, as a matter within the B3 general business zone under zoning contingency in their draft purchase and sale agreement? I, I believe their the existing lot, the um, the existing lot where the where the Land Rover is is in B3, and this back lot is in the Highest Parkway district. Um, this, is, this is a separate parcel. This parcel is actually part of the Enterprise Business Park. Um, that they're purchasing and, and sort of adjoining, if you will, to the uh, front lot. Yeah, I, 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 and I, I just want to clear. The, the reason for my questioning is because I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I, I was a little taken aback by the fact that we keep extending contract zones and keep pushing it out, and this is going to be number six. They keep growing and growing and growing, and that's a good thing, but now they presented it as a safety issue uh, because of all the growth that they've done. And I'm not too thrilled about putting another parking lot there um, and just making it a giant paved surface. So uh, I'm, you know, I, there, there's some inconsistencies that I found in the application um, that I, I thought was a little sloppy, for lack of a better word, but probably not enough to hold it up. So, other comments? Thank you, Jay. Uh, seeing none, ready to vote. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, new business. Uh, we're taking up order 18-70. Act on the request to schedule a public, public hearing for Wednesday, October 24, 2018 at 6 p.m. regarding the establishment of a downtown tax increment financing district, including the authorization uh, of a credit enhancement agreement for the Downs, Crossroads Holdings, LLC, and I'll ask the town manager to introduce this matter. Yes, as part of the statutory requirement for establishment of a uh, TIF district, there must be a public hearing requiring 12, uh, 10 days notice. Uh, frankly, we put this off further than your rex next regular meeting, which would be the 17th, to allow staff and, and uh, our consulting uh, legal team to make sure we have all the documents in place. Part of that notice requirements is that the documents be uh, sufficiently prepared and available for public review and inspection. So uh, we've asked for a special meeting. Frankly, I think it, uh, given the amount of interest in the subject, uh, it will serve us better to have a single item agenda on that uh, that evening of October mm -hmm. 24. So this uh, is the first step in the process. And and I, I would want to make it very clear, uh, a, a step that has to be taken is to hold a public hearing. We are going to hold other public hearings, and we uh, identified the dates for those uh, between now and October 24th, and we may determine that there's a need to hold further hearings, public hearings, or meetings, or workshops after that date. Uh, this particular action item does not set the date on which we will decide whether to enter into a credit enhancement agreement and a TIF district, uh, it's simply another step in the process. And as I think I've said on a number of occasions, it's not my intention to advance a final vote until we have all fully understood and had the opportunity to input uh, on this credit enhancement agreement proposal. Uh, and the public has been well informed and we've had the opportunity to receive feedback from the public so that we have a good sense of where uh, the community stands. Will. Would you take a question now before the public comment? I, my, my. Yes, as a part of the introduction. Okay, thank you. Um, could you clarify, this is, would still require a first read, a second read, and a, a public hearing, the, the TIF issue in, in general, or no? No, it would be a, a, a single action item at a future meeting after October 24th, the date of which is not established. Uh, given that introduction, I'm going to ask any member of the public with an interest in speaking to the Downs issue generally or the establishment of a public hearing date to please approach the podium. You have three minutes, state your name and address. Thank you. Again, hi. Uh, Dave Merrill, 29 Jamico Mill Road, Scarborough. Um, I am here um, personally to support this uh, enthusiastically, uh, but also uh, I've been a member of the Comprehensive Plan Committee since probably 2004. Uh, I've watched this germinate from a seed 
um, in the visioning and the, uh, the early process of surveys in the 2000s when the town was uh, questioned and um, asked about what they want to see in the future of Scarborough. Two things came up repeatedly and have since in the last 18 years. Uh, one is a town center and two is what are we going to do with Scarborough Downs. Um, I see in this proposal um, a win-win for both of those issues and a win-win for both sides of this argument. Um, I have watched uh, in frustration over these last 10 or 15 years uh, a senior center, a community center, a Y, two hockey rinks, two expansions to the library, and other public amenities to this town be unsupported and not come to fruition. And I think it would be a shame for this to not have the support of the town and the support of the community. Uh, I understand that both sides of this, uh, of this negotiation will do their due diligence. Um, I trust in our representative de democracy to, to, pro to provide for our residents and to um, make the best deal that you guys can. Uh, I also want to uh, salute the developers for bringing forth this proposal. Um, I would be, uh, again, truly disappointed to see this go all residential. Um, the vision that we had through the comprehensive plan and through all the visioning that's happened over the years has been for a mixed-use development. It provides for many, many amenities to this town, um, from um, industrial use to residential use, community use, public areas, the town center, uh, and, and the list goes on. So I hope you'll all support this. Uh, I look forward to seeing the final numbers, and I'm sure they will support a, 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 a fruitful uh, and, a, and a hopeful decision to make this go forward in a mixed-use development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Karam Durda, and I live on uh, Six Haystack Circle. I want to seriously uh, and sincerely thank the town council and the due deliberation it's conducting regarding the tip for Scarborough Downs and letting me offer my uh, perspective on the situation. My perspective on the situation is informed by 25 years of uh, some corporate leadership and indeed intimately participating in some economic development activities for the state of Maine, utilizing state and federal instruments and architectures. Um, I find the current opposition to the TIF self-limiting, subject to some profound misunderstanding of what constitutes economic development and dangerously myopic desire to not participate in the social contract. It is self-limiting because it presumes there is some nefarious scheme to outwit and fleece and run contrary to facts. This toxic rejection of facts, this toxic rot in facts. And the fact is that if the Downs exists, the tax burden incumbent on the Downs is actually leveraged by the town and the Downs to create economic wealth over a long course of time. That's an unassailable fact. I believe the public hearing where the facts were distributed and continue to be distributed will make that abundantly clear. I urge the town council not to keep on doing the same thing again and again. You're distributing the facts and I don't think you need to do it for another couple of months. The profound misunderstanding by the opposition to this effort is that economic development is independent of a shared burden by the private and the societal sector. It's actually only successful when those who are inextricably bound to each other with shared responsibility and buy-in. This current threat of opposition where anything that smells of development is somehow a cabal response to more taxation is insidious. I hope you soundly reject it. It is also myopic to not participate in the social contract. We need to overcome this myopia by letting you as the leaders of the town decide rather than a useless referendum that has been in the conversation. That is an excuse to throw hurdles and confusion under the guise of participatory democracy. <clears throat> this is the order of the day. There's a level of urgency. We need to get this done. So I hope you do your job as leaders. Do remember, and I urge you to remember, that there are other towns like Saco, Biddeford, and South Portland that are ahead of Scarborough when it comes to very strategic and forward-leaning 21st century growth and sustainability plans. We are here sometimes arguing about appetizers while the rest of the world is on the main course. I don't know Rocco Rosbera. I don't. But I do strongly suspect he's deeply thought of the mechanics of the business and melded it to a sense of contribution and legacy to his town home. The question we should be asking and answering with him 
is when do we build additional school infrastructures? How do we ensure a more vibrant and impactful community rec center functionality? And a hub for small and light industrial businesses that allows us to create a life for our kids, with our kids, so they can do it here in Maine and become a paragon of 21st century living. I truly believe he would do that. So why don't we do so with due haste and intent and allow the son of Scarborough to do what is right and necessary for its future? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elaine Richer, 5 Reef Lane, 28 East Grand Ave. Um, my comment is I'm wondering if you're going to tackle the, this word um, traffic uh, in your proposal, uh, whether it's during the time that you're looking at this. And I know this project isn't the only one that contributes to traffic. And if you haven't experienced traffic yourself, I'm going to just give you my interpretation of what happened to me the other night. Um, Friday, 4.30, I am going from Oak Hill to Pine Point. Uh, you probably already heard there are 14 traffic lights between 295 and the end. Um, but what happened during this period of time is it's 4.30, we're not in summer. I am going 20 miles an hour until I get to the marsh, and then I am going somewhere between zero and five across the entire marsh. And that is something that it's just, I mean, maybe it's the way we have it. We have choices. I can go on Payne Road like everybody else does, and they switch back and forth to see which way is going to be the easiest to get around. But I think that if we're proposing this kind of a project, that we need to say more than the word traffic in our presentation. We need to talk about it. We need to say, is there anything we can do? I'm not sure there is. But I think it needs to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Susan Hamill, uh, Bay Street in Prime Point. Um, what's the schedule? And I, I know that, so once you set the, the public hearing on the 24th, you've got to let 10 days elapse before you can actually take a vote. So. Uh -huh. That vote no, can that's happen. not correct. No, the, the ten-day requirement is uh, to notice the public hearing itself. There's no uh, legal wait period, or okay. if you after that. So part. once once the um, the public hearing is held, um, you could at the very next council meeting um, take a vote, yeah. and um, and that vote could happen on November seventh, day after the election, when the current council is still <clears throat> seated. The new counselors won't be seated until the following meeting. So I, I have a concern that um, this process is being speeded up to take advantage of the sitting council and the way the votes kind of tend to line up on so many issues. Um, that's one concern. Another concern is the downtown TIF. And I don't I don't have any legal expertise, but I have read a little bit about what is required with the downtown TIF. The state says that the application must include a comprehensive redevelopment plan with lots of specific items, projects um, that are described. And so my question is, what is the money going to be spent for? So we saw a slide that showed $265 million that would be coming just from the downs. Um, in captured that revenue above the costs. And what is what are we going to do with that money? I'm assuming that the 265 of that, I mean one half of it will go to pay the costs. And this 265 is above and beyond what the costs are. So is the council um, going to decide to put that money um, toward a library and um, have somebody build a library and we lease the building back to get around the state requirement. And the council could decide that, not the people, it wouldn't go out to a bond, wouldn't, it's not a bond issue, so it would never go to the voters. You could do a $25 million library. You could do um, a $50 million community center and never have to put this out to the voters. And I have a lot of concerns about that. Um, <coughs> you might decide to put heated sidewalks on Route 1. I have a lot of, you know, I mean, you could spend the money any way you want. 
And I would like to see some specific information on how is the money going to be spent. I haven't heard anything about, other than saying that we've got to take care of some traffic issues, I haven't heard or seen any, um, any write-up of how the money is going to be spent. And I'm, I also am very concerned about the, the missing information. What are the assumptions that the cost estimates are based on? How many children per unit? Um, <coughs> none of the, 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 the financial modeling has not been um, shared with the public. And um, so I would like to see that. Um, last thing is the, co is the comprehensive plan and how it plays into it. That comprehensive plan of 2006 was really written in 2004 and 5. That was 14 years ago. No one at that point could see the way retail industry completely has collapsed. It's just not coming back. It's gone. And so when they envisioned a main street for Scarborough, I'm sure that part of that was a vibrant retail area. And we are not going to be getting that. I mean, that's, so that's been carried forward into the new comprehensive plan, which has only, the, the new comprehensive plan process talked to only 1% of Scarborough population. Fewer than 200 people were involved in, it, until we got to the final, the final item, which was the survey, the, the internet survey. Could you wrap so, up, please? That is, um, you know, I still have a lot of questions about the downtown um, project. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Rocco Rismera, 287 Black Point Road. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out a couple of things that I, I probably didn't, didn't get across earlier in the meeting tonight. Um, risk to the town. There's very little, if any, risk to the town under our uh, credit enhancement agreement. Um, and, and one of the ways that we're, made, we're mitigating that risk, we're, we're going to put all of the infrastructure in the ground. We're going to spend all the money. No money flows back to us unless we create value. If you folks can see your way to take a vote on this as soon as possible, you're going to help us mitigate risk by allowing us to get one of the best, <coughs> uh, highest ROI model areas of, of our uh, project built soon. When we know we have uh, demand. We know we have demand for light industrial right now, and if you uh, see a way to uh, enter into a CAA with us, it will allow us to get that area built now. One of the things that did come up in the uh, review of our market analysis um, that I believe Mr. Brin did, um, he felt the first 10 years really, you know, felt good. As you get further out, obviously it's, it's harder to predict that. But he felt that if we were successful in this first 10 years, <coughs> if we really did make some strides, that the second 10-year piece was quite plausible. And I think that's important to note, that we need your help to get this thing going now while we have market. Can you address the lady's question about traffic? Uh, can you Certainly. speak, to, speak so to that I, issue? I'd traffic, like to be able to give an opportunity to answer questions as they're presented. It's sometimes difficult to do it, because I'm not sure who is ready to step up, but I figure Mr. Rosbera is as good as anyone to ask. Traffic obviously is, is an issue uh, for all of us here in town, and it's something that you know we, we live in, and breathe it every day. Uh, we deal with it. So um, as part of our, um, our development of the property, uh, detailed traffic in, uh, studies will be done. Uh, as we, we've gone along with phase one, we know what our traffic implications are. Um, we've gone through the planning process. We know um, uh, improvements that have to be made, uh, we have to make, uh, again, on our, our dime. Uh, and also we'll be paying traffic impact fees to help uh, the town make future decisions and future improvements uh, with traffic. And that will continue through the project. So as we go through the approval process, traffic will be addressed uh, at each phase of the development. And uh, I think that uh, there are certainly a lot of things that can be done uh, to improve the traffic flow on Route 1 uh, and the Payne Road. Uh, but overall, part of what we're trying to do with the Downs is keep a lot of that traffic within the downs. People can live there and work there. People maybe would be in a situation where they don't have to go out on Route 1 every single day, and, and they don't have to go out at those peak hours. So that's something to really think about. It. You know, when you think about smart growth, uh, that, that's a lot of what the downs uh, master plan is all about. The second question that was raised by the previous speaker was that 
retail space, uh, real buildings selling retail space like malls are finding more and more vacancies. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a movement away from that. And you've talked about a downtown. Uh, have you taken into account the potential adverse impact on retail space? We, we certainly have. I mean, big box, uh, we, we all know, we've, we've read about it and, and have lived sure. it. Uh, not a lot of demand for big box retail at this point in time. Um, I do see a place uh, within our project for a uh, possible grocery store, and I think that that could be a very likely scenario could come. But the majority of our retail, we think, is going to be uh, smaller, more local, um, like <coughs> local type retail, smaller spaces. We don't really see a lot of big box, but uh, that, that's how our master plan is geared towards that style of use, which, which seems to be popular today. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak, please approach the podium. Uh, my name is Cindy Kierick. I'm at Moores Point Road in Scarborough. Um, I am here because I would like you to support this district and the Downs project. Scarborough is growing. I, I think that's a, a non-negotiable item. And this land is either going to sit empty or it's going to be developed. I would really like to see it developed in a manner that is mixed use. I would love to see affordable and senior housing. I'd love to be able to retire in this town and be able to buy a condo that costs less than $380,000 plus, you know, condo fees every month. I'd really like to see another artery between Route 1 and Payne Road, Hagas Parkway. I mean, that's going to divert some traffic. I really like that the houses are going to be centrally located and we're not going to be in the outlying areas that can't handle the additional traffic. The initial costs for a developer are going to be really high on this project and most people around here don't have that kind of money to do that. We have a local developer who knows our community and lives in our community and I would presume would like to see our community move in a positive direction and continue to grow and why we wouldn't encourage that is really kind of beyond my understanding because the other option is the land can get sold to somebody from Massachusetts or Virginia who's going to come up here slam in whatever they want and then they're going to hightail it out of here. I'd rather have somebody who's invested in our community. Um, my final thought is this, when we moved here, I've only lived here since 1999, so not as long term as many people, but when we moved here we were fighting over a senior center and then we thought about a why and we thought about community centers and here we are almost 20 years later and we don't have any of those things. We have nothing in this community other than Memorial Park that pulls people together and constantly in our community we're fighting with each other. And I really think that's because there's no opportunities for us to be a community and interact. This development potentially gives us that possibility. And I would really love to see that happen. Now, obviously, there's a lot about this that I don't understand and is kind of above my pay grade. And that's what you guys are here for. I trust your judgment and asking the right questions. But I'd really like you to consider this. And I'd really like to see this move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Larry Hartwell, 9, Puritan Drive. Um, there's been a lot of stories out there about all this misinformation being uh, presented by smart taxes or myself and others. Um, I don't know how it could be called misinformation because there was no information three weeks ago. And we were just trying to get the word out. I was trying to get the word out that this is a big deal. It's a once in a lifetime thing. We need to at least know about it. I'm not against it. I, I've heard very few people at, at these meetings say that they were against the development. I've been to three of them in the last two weeks, and I haven't heard you know people throwing rocks at Rocky or saying anything negative basically about his, uh, his development and his plans. There's been a few people with, with some, some concerns there. What I have heard consistently is people wanting to have a say in this, to have some sort of a referendum or something on it. I understand that's not on the table. It's not going to happen. It may be legal, but I don't know that it's, I don't think it's right. Um, we heard tonight um, discussion about the TIF, which is the first thing that has to come along in the discussion 
<coughs> public uh, discussion has been because on this on the credit enhancement agreement and the development. Um, and so I hear tonight that we know very little about a TIF. What I keep hearing on the TIF is, all right, and I don't understand why we want to take all of our downtown and, and fold it into this, other than, oh, it's a way for us, for you folks, or your or the council in the future, to use the money as they please. Um, because we keep saying, okay, we're a, there's a, we don't have the tax advantage of some poor town saying, oh, we're going to save 40 cents on the dollar. You keep coming back and saying it's only 5%, it's only 5%. Enhancements to the roads and so forth, we can do that with the tax dollars. It doesn't need to be tied up in a TIF. Um, earlier it was mentioned about uh, 750 homes, that we lose money on those, that those cost us money. Well, what about um, townhouses and multifamily houses? Or these ones, and I'm not sure what they're called, but the ones where you, you build two houses and you connect them at the at where the garage is. Those aren't going to be considered one to four families. So the 750 is just freestanding homes, but all these other ones are going to have two or three bedrooms. And I, I don't see that it's going to be any different as far as the kids are concerned, the number of children that's going to be in this development, as opposed to saying, oh, we're only going to have children in the um, single family homes. And I'm running out of time. Um, Mr. Donovan, in, in your, your letter last week in the, uh, the, in the leader, the, the last line says, critique it, question it. From here, we go forward, together or not of, at all. I think that's misleading, unless you want to explain why, what it actually means. Anyone else wishing to uh, address the council? Richard Hayes, Martin Avenue, from Scarborough. Uh, I'm not against this project. I am against its timetable. Uh, I believe that this is being uh, rushed. Uh, and I do have a question. Is it my understanding that on the 24th at the public hearing, the council could take the one and only vote mm -hmm. and that would be the end of it? No. Cannot do that. I think to be technically correct, I beg your pardon, yeah. uh, you could technically, but I have heard no mention of that um, whatsoever. Okay. So it's but it is a possibility yeah. the council could decide to do that. We would have to notice it in the as part of the action item. Uh, uh, fair enough. Uh, correct? Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, and right. we're not intending to do so. So what is the, what is the soonest date after <clears throat> that that you could... Could be as uh, whatever legal notice was required. So it could be uh, three days, could be four days, could be a month. Counselor, Can I clarify just from an experience Counselor standpoint? Beba. And I hate to bring up old sore wounds, but um, <laughs> there was a, a similar issue with the Piper Shores when it was first um, approved, in which um, the council at that time in the 90s actually had a special meeting with 24 hours notice and then approved Piper Shores. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anyone on this council who intends to go. <laughs> no, I just want to make sure that, it, I mean, that's what happened. So it could technically happen, but I think right. that's a very negative position to take. Well, I, I just think that th this is moving too quickly. I think more input should come from more people in the town. Uh, I also have concerns, uh, as the previous gentleman said, about the uh, TIF money just going into a a fund. I, I think if there's tax revenue, it should go into the general fund uh, and, and not be in some special fund that can be decided by, I guess, just the town council uh, without public input. Uh, taxes are public money, and uh, more people involved in, in the voice of it, spend, it being spent uh, mm -hmm. is benefit for everyone. So uh, I just again ask that that uh, you consider uh, delaying and not rushing this, this vote through. Uh, thank you. Any other comments?
Good evening. My name is Carl Gautreaux, 27 J. McComb Mill Road in Scarborough. And uh, Scarborough is a really nice town, by the way. Um, I've, listened, I've come to a handful of meetings now, and one thing that is, is quite clear is that uh, internal to the team that is making the, the decisions on this huge project, which is going to extend 30 years plus our lifetime for sure, the, the knowledge and the information coming forward is not sufficient to make a decision on this project right now by the council. I will say that Rocco and his team have done an excellent job. They know what their numbers are. They know what they have to do, and they know what their pressure point is, and they know what they have to do to get their client in on a certain date. What I'm hearing here tonight and at the other meetings, our, our, our team really does not have all of the answers that it needs to make a decision. So this could be very good for the town. It could be timely for the town. Uh, uh, going forward, hopefully we could all look back and say this was a good exercise. But the exercise should be somewhat determined by the voice of the people. And, and I'm here tonight to ask you to, to, to take a, a hard look at, I'm not going to say slow the process down, because I don't want Rocco to jump out of the seat over there. Um, <laughs> What I'm saying is, listen to the voice of the people. I've been to a handful of meetings, as I've said, and, and I, I can hear the voice, and I can hear what they're saying. I'm not sure the voice is landing on, on, on ears and being interpreted in the way it's trying to be communicated. And that is, it's very important that the people be heard, that there should be time built into the project to do it right. Uh, Rocco's got his numbers now. We don't have ours. Um, we should, we should have this go forward with a new council, and I would like to suggest that we would have a referendum vote on this project, um, which would bring the town together. You have an opportunity to bring the town together. So get your numbers down. We shouldn't be, having, we shouldn't be hearing anybody saying they don't have them all yet. Uh, I think it's incumbent, incumbent upon us as a council uh, of the town to want to make sure we have it all down pat. And, and, and Rocky's gonna keep the pressure on, okay? But I don't think at this point we should be working under pressure. He'll do a better job and we will do a better job if we go forward with a fresh council and I'd like to see a referendum vote. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Paula O'Brien, Pondview Drive. Um, I'm not for or against the project because I don't know enough of the details. And I guess that's the problem that a lot of people that I've talked to have. Um, I know some of the developers and I like them a lot, you know, um, and I have no doubt they'd do a good job. But I think if, if we can set aside tens of thousands of dollars for the a study for a library edition or for this or for that. How come we can't do an independent study on behalf of the town? I know, you know, that developers have their study and then there's this study, this SEDCO one or whatever, but how come you can't do an independent analysis on behalf of the town with their own representative? Um, that's what I'm hearing a lot about and people just want more details. I think it could be a good thing. I, keep, I think it could be um, a downtown triple crown, you know, but, um, or it could be a, a flounder, good horse you know. Horse. But um, you, you don't want it, I mean, nobody wants to see the taxpayers, you know, we all know that a lot of seniors in this town are struggling as it is. So I, I just hate to see more of a tax burden and I just think we should come up with our own numbers. Thank you. Further comment? Close the public comment period and I'll accept a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. 
Councilor Baker. Although not relevant to the, necessarily this particular item, I do hope that uh, as we discuss when the item is taken up into consideration is that we don't pull, a, pull any antics that have been maybe uh, taken up in prior mm -hmm. councils many decades ago. If, if, and I'm sure we'll Now, Sean described uh, that circumstance rather well. And if anyone actually had a contrary view to Sean's wish, I wish they would say it now because I feel pretty strongly that I would not want to see this come back until we've had uh, a good bit of feedback from the community so we have a good sense of where they are. Uh, we continue with the public hearings that we've been holding uh, and we as a council keep digging a little bit deeper uh, and we get more information out to the public and I have to applaud <laughs> Karen Martin and Tom Hall's efforts in that regard. They certainly have, have worked nonstop on this issue. So, Can I? Katie. I do not hold a contrarian view, um, <laughs> but I do want to just say that um, I understand where it comes from and I understand when, when things like this come up, because it has happened, you know, history is a good teacher, it has happened. So uh, if you can avoid that, if the perception out there is that it could happen, well then let's <coughs> sidestep it and not make that a possibility. So I understand that perception is often reality and I respect that even <coughs> though I don't feel like anyone sitting behind this table would do that, I really don't. Um, and we disagree on a lot of stuff, and everybody knows that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I trust that everyone has the best of intentions here. So. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, I'd, um, I think, I believe you said earlier, 10 days notice is required for the, for the hearing. Is that correct? That's why we're doing it tonight, so as to be able to have the uh, materials ready on October 24th. And there's a substantial... Well, 10 days before October 24th. For the, documents the, the documentation has ready. to be ready. So there's a whole other trove of more detailed information that will be coming out by October 14th. Do, do, do we have a confidence level that we're going to be ready with, with that documentation? Doesn't that have to dictate what we're going to be doing with these funds to be able to, as part of the... No. No, it's just... Well, I, I believe it does, actually. Yeah. The, the, the one piece that I alluded to at the meeting um, earlier, at the workshop, was whether we wish to divert any of the tax revenue um, any other place than the general fund. And if we do, we need to articulate that. Yes. Sounds like Katerina. Um, which, is, I'm gonna interrupt my thought process, but I'm gonna ask the question that I'm interrupted with, my ADHD is kicking in here. So therefore, whatever we put in for this hearing on the 24th, can that be changed once we've had public hearings and heard that people yes. don't want that? Yes. I, I, would I would defer to legal so. counsel. I think it depends if it's a substantive change. I suspect so additional public hearings may be required, but uh, yeah. until I know what the substance of the change is, I really can't answer. Because mm -hmm. I, I see this hearing as being uh, the beginning of getting some more um, formalized, I guess is the word I want, or legal, if you want to call it legal, feedback from the community, because that's what the, that's what I'm hearing. We want our voices heard, we want an input in this and whatever. So that's why I would support it tonight, because I think we do need to start the process of hearing from the people. I will tell people that I have absolutely no intention of moving this forward any more quickly than I'd be comfortable with knowing all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. <clears throat> and um, if it, and, um, I would think it's going to go to the next council. I mean, that's just the way it's going to go. But that's my opinion. No, sir. Um, so I want to back up and just uh, just address the whole entire piece. So one, one question I had or uh, concern is I thought Initially, we had, as a council, discussed separating the two, voting on in implementing the TIF, downtown TIF district and the CEA being a separate piece. Yeah. Um, neither here nor there, because it's mm -hmm. here we are. But, but one of my concerns is that, like, even with tonight's workshop, and I thought it was a good workshop, but even with that, we, you had two framing questions um, to start the workshop, and we didn't get an opportunity to even go around as a council and share our thoughts on those two pieces, as well as the conversation about, you know, what, if any, would we want to allocate 
funds for and what. So I would love to have those conversations mm -hmm. in advance mm -hmm. um, as well. And those, so that's just how I'm feeling. It was like, I, I felt like there were a lot of, it was great, but we could have used another hour. <laughs> yeah. And again, I'm just not in <clears throat> the place where I want to rush through. I think taking our time and doing it right is gonna make it better for us, better for our community. So I'd, see, I'd like to see us take some more time. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I have similar concerns that we're, we're just, I don't feel like we're close enough. I, mm. I feel like had, had we had a, had, were this following a, a traditional two-step process and we were going to have our, right. our first read, maybe at our next meeting, then we, we you know, could then kick around some ideas and, and be more aligned on what we're going to be presenting to the, to the public at, for a public hearing. I just don't feel like we're, we're there yet. And so I, I'm really concerned about setting a date without even knowing what it is that, that we're going to be doing. I get the concept. But I, I just feel like there are a lot of unknowns that are left. Thank you. Councilor Bailey. So a, um, a couple of things. One is um, roughly there's 21 days between now and then. I think that, if anything, um, we need to do our work and provide a commitment that we can be available to have these public conversations to support having the public hearing. Keep in mind, this is a public hearing only. And we do need to express some of those details that we've talked about, but don't need to necessarily make a decision. The other thing I wanted to suggest under Robert's rules is that I believe the chair does have the discretion in which to present the following action item, such as composing it into a first reading and a second reading. I think that within our own town council rules, if I remember, remember them correctly, the chair does have the discretion on how it is presented to the public. So you might want to be able to take a look at that, Mr. Chairman, and see Thank if you. we can change that, because I think you can um, to meet um, the gentleman's needs. Um, Last is that I, I think that um, if I remember the, the data table that we have looked at that has provided everything, um, not one sitting councilor today is going to be here when the money comes in the door because we'll all be term limited no matter what. So I hope that we don't take into consideration any political attributes about who's sitting at the council, when they're sitting at the council, and how that influences any timeline or any decision because the money's not coming until then. And the fact is, is that any future council can change anything that we set today to whatever they feel the community needs at that time. Further comments? Councilor Kettering, then Councilor Hayes. So I'm still confused, but that's okay. Um, so what we're doing here is we're setting a public hearing for Wednesday, October 24th at 6 p.m. And it's regarding the establishment of a downtown tax increment financing district, including authorization of credit enhancement agreement for the downs. So, if we're having a public hearing on something that we don't really, I mean, we know what it is, sort of, but I thought we were going to get more public input before, so I'm, I'm not making any sense, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm cons I am concerned, I, I share some of the same concerns that, I don't want us to get boxed in. I don't mind doing this. I think it's great to have a public hearing and whatever, but I don't want to be boxed in that we can't change whatever it is that we're presenting yes. after we hear from the public more changes that need to happen. So is this the right move to make right now? That's my question. Just if I could, the, the, I guess the worst case scenario, and I don't think it's terrible, is that if there's substantive changes, it may necessitate an additional 10-day notice on oh, public sure. hearing. <laughs> uh, in my mind, the only piece of information uh, not yet available and, and having been discussed with council is what, if anything, do we do with our revenue? Exactly. And barring any clear direction, I'm forced to draft those documents assuming that all revenue goes to the general fund. Now, that can be amended by this council, by future councils, uh, to modify that. The reality is um, the revenues really will not exist in the early years. Years one through five are really not performing very well. So there's not much money to be, be talking about, frankly. And what I do expect is that there'll be uh, extensive discussions in the community uh, in that time frame before the first four years, generally around all these issues. So uh, I think there'll be ample opportunity to make those decisions at a later date. Uh, you could certainly direct me to do something now, but borrowing a direct, uh, a specific direction, um, I can only assume that it all will go to the general fund. I, that reflects my understanding also, that, uh, that we tried to build into the 
agreement, processes that go out for years to allow the community to really provide us input and we could analyze the concepts of a downtown and a community center, as well as other things that we feel are priorities where funds would go. And I, I echo the comments that many of us won't be here when, those when the facts are clear on the ground as to how the money should be spent. We're not gonna be here. So that I've always understood that that decision was really, it all goes to the general fund until we come up with a plan. But the plan is years down the road. Peter. Yeah, I guess first, just kind of a point of clarification, which I understand, I guess it's directed at the chair. Yes, we can change the tip and how we decide on the monies, but once we sign a credit enhancement agreement, that can't be changed unless the other party agrees, right? Credit enhancement yeah. agreement is an agreement. Yeah, so, so I mean, so we have some flexibility around the TIF and the revenues. Sure. But once we sign the credit enhancement agreement, that's not modifiable unless both parties agree. Well, that's correct. Okay. So, that's correct. so my question tonight, I guess I'm in a place, and I kind of echo in others, I'm uncomfortable setting a public hearing date tonight for the various reasons. And actually, I'll reference something our chair wrote to constituents yesterday saying his goals are promote Scarborough physical sustainability fiscal sustainability, absolutely agree. Assure that the analysis of any agreement is thorough and professional, totally agree, and seek public input. And I guess my place is we've had some public input. Everybody's, I'm sure everybody's mailbox has been flooded with people sending us emails. And the three things I've heard is, we, you know, we kind of need to do a financial modeling. They want to see the numbers. We've talked about it tonight, and I think Councilor Foley and I thought we were going to do an independent financial analysis. Um, I heard tonight we're actually going to have, we bought a software package, we made some modifications to a software package, we're going to go back to the software engineer <laughs> to test the integrity of the model, but that's not a financial plan. That's not a financial profession. So I'm uncomfortable. I think we have a due diligence responsibility. I think we have a fiduciary responsibility. I'd like, it, and it's really important because we've talked a lot about risk. The risk to the town is not the CEA, because you're absolutely right, we're not gonna pay out revenues until we get it in. The risk to the town is we have assumed that for every dollar we keep, that town service is only gonna cost us 40 cents on the dollar. But if, that, if those town services, if we've made some assumptions, and it's a different assumption, it just takes little changes to throw this analysis off hundreds of millions. I can sit here, I did this work for Hannaford, I'll admit to everybody out here, I, this is above my pay grade. I am confused by the numbers. I don't understand the numbers. I've wanted to see them for the last two weeks. I haven't been able to see anything. We did see a spreadsheet early on, but we've made some changes as you've heard tonight. I don't know what those changes are and what the underlying documents are. So I think we owe it to our community to get the financial information out there, let them to have time to process it, and then we can come back. And, and So I, I'm not comfortable move into the public hearing until we have that financial information verified. And again, I'll go back to, to Councillor Donovan who said in, in a letter, in, in, we need to trust but verify. We do trust, but we need to have professionals verify this. Just as we did on the growth projection, that professional confirmed some things, but gave some cautions. We need, we need to do our due diligence and get someone else who does this, this type of work to sign off the assumptions we've made are valid. And whenever I did this for Hannaford, there was, you know, we did a sensitivity analysis. If you're off on something, if you change a variable, what does that do? Over 30 years, it doesn't take much to change it. So our risk is not the payout to the developer. Our risk is what if we don't cover the cost of what we have left over, that goes to the taxpayers if we have miscalculated. And I'm not comfortable until I see it. I'm not saying I'm for it or against it. I just, I don't. I'm uncomfortable with the numbers until I get to see them. And, and I think the community is saying the same thing. They're uncomfortable. They want to see the numbers. They want to have a professional opinion to say these are valid. No one's questioned us on the growth projections. They saw that, you know, they saw that analysis. That's not the question they're asking. The question they're asking is what about the numbers? So I'm not comfortable moving forward to a public hearing until, the, until we get that information to the community. It's unclear to me tonight when we're committing to get that information out. If we're going to go to a financial professional, it's going to take two weeks to get that out and back and turned around. 
Thank you. Councilor Kazan. So from all of the public input I've heard, and I've heard quite a bit of it, apparently I am the big bad wolf because I'm the only person who will not be here after, no, after the November election, perhaps <laughs> Councilor Rowan as well. So I appreciate, I appreciate the, the um, desire not to allow me to have a vote on this for whatever reason that is, and I'm comfortable with that, to be honest with you. Um, so I guess I'll make comments as a lame duck, for lack of a better word. Um, I will caution the Council on a couple of issues. Number one, we've talked about this in the past. The TIF has to come first before any CEA can come. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to be doing that for a month and a half or longer now, and we haven't done that. So it is incumbent upon us to move that process along. Um, I personally have, uh, as an engineer, I think we always run the risk of what I call paralysis by analysis. Mm -hmm. You get afraid and afraid, and you cannot, you cannot ever, and I think Councillor Hayes has agreed, you cannot predict every single variable to the nth degree. So if you continue to, to delay in the hopes of getting better and better and better data, I, I am fearful we will have another Haigas Parkway on our hands because the inability to act of this body uh, is going to force the, uh, the, the developer, whomever that may be, to either get out because they can't realize the, 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 the goals that they had, and they are shared goals, or uh, at worst um, be stuck with an albatross like Haigas or another issue, uh, or Cabela's or something like that. So um, it, in, in terms of a public hearing, yes, I do believe we need to have the details of the TIF worked out. Um, I, I'm, if the only thing we have left to do is to discuss the split, then I suggest we get some information on what sheltering that revenue looks like, why we would want to do that, the pros and the cons, like we've done everything else, uh, and have a workshop on it and get it done because uh, I think there are other opportunities out there, uh, aside from the biggest one that we've ever seen, that could be impacted by this. And I think we do have to get our ducks in order first. So um, I, I'm going to defer to the will of the rest of the council. Uh, if a vote comes up between now and November 6th or November 9th or whatever the other conspiracy theories are out there, um, I will do my due diligence. I will act in uh, accordance of my role as a town councillor and I'll vote the way that I think is appropriate based on input from people that I trust. Uh, if that doesn't come to fruition, then and I, I just am concerned that the longer we take, we've heard it from the developer, we've heard it from other developers, the longer we take, the more opportunity we have to let something like this slip through our fingers. And I, and I personally, I have not seen, no matter how many analysis we run, not seen the downside to the town yet. I haven't seen one particular issue or one particular caveat where we said this is going to be a problem. <coughs> to Councillor Hayes's point about operational data, that's true no matter what we do. Mm. That's true whether we have a downs or whether we don't have a downs. And we struggle with that every single budget year when we start doing how, how, how difficult is it for us to do a three or a five year projection on our budget. We simply don't have that information. We don't know. So the, the inability to act based on the need for more data I, I would just caution the, caution the council that that could turn around and bite the town if we wait too long. Councilor Gettering. Uh, through the chair, if I could ask Councilor Cayazzo, um, does it make any sense, and actually I'll throw it out to everyone, but to start with Councilor Cayazzo, um, to just have a public hearing on the TIF portion without the credit enhancement? I does think that it, make sense, or is that totally what I'm going to start with? Can I respond? Uh, yes. yes, although I'm not sure well, it, it's a legal question. It, it, exactly. It's, okay. it's my understanding that the, the, actually the terms of the credit enhancement agreement not necessarily be even known. Uh, it's very customary for TIF district to be approved and there be delegated authority for the council to adopt credit enhancement agreements in the future. In this instance, we have uh, it fairly fully formed. I think it makes sense to subject that to the same level of review and scrutiny of the public. But from a legal point of view, it's my understanding that it's not necessary. So if I could? Conflict. So I, I understand it's not necessary to get public input and public approval, but I do think we need to have the details and we need to decide how we want the splits to go. So just the assumption that it should all go to the general fund, that may be the outcome of it. But we have to look seriously at is it, is, it a, is it fiscally responsible not to shelter any of that revenue and put it all in the general fund? That's, to me, that's the discussion that we have to have. Mm -hmm. um, not, not the question of creating the TIF or what the boundaries are going to be or what the legalities are of it. I think we, we're, I, I, I personally feel like, unless I'm mistaken, we're far enough along in those discussions 
where, to your point, the chairman's point, we're just looking at the splits. What, what do we want to shelter any? All, right now, all of our assumptions are based on going back in the general fund. Is that valid? How do we want to approach that? And, and it, it, it would seem to me that that discussion needs to take place in a workshop. Sure. Uh, and that the workshop ought to be held on uh, October 17th when we get next meet, uh, which would allow the staff time to uh, get as much information as is necessary. They have to have the information ready 10 days in advance, so we'd all have that information by the 14th at the latest for the 24th. And on the 17th, we'd hold the workshop to discuss the question of do we put it all in the general fund or is there some other allocation? Uh, ladies Katie first? Yeah, ladies first. Councilor Bailey. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that my, that I expressed myself properly earlier or articulated what I really feel. I'm not asking for more data. We've got more data than I care to look at, to be honest with you. And, um, and it is confusing to know <laughs> over the head a little bit. And again, no slight at all to Karen Martin. Absolutely uh, think she's amazing. Trust what she's done. I, have it, I don't have it in my hands. And she's shared that with us. We all have acknowledged that we don't have that in our hands yet. <clears throat> so that's what I'm asking for. I'm asking for that in our hands. Um, and then I, I would still feel most comfortable with a third party just saying, you know, not Rockies people, and I trust, and I'm very also invested in the fact that these are local folks. I've said all along, the last thing I would want to see is an out-of-state mm -hmm. group coming in here and doing this. I feel like they are the right people to be doing this. So all of the pieces are there. I just want to make sure we're putting them together in the mm -hmm. right order and in the right way. Um, and, uh, you know, that third-party person giving the stamp who has no ties to either of them would be powerful to me. And I think it would be powerful to the community. But neither here nor there. So I'm, I, I would really wish we could find out the, question, or the answer to Will's question around our ability to separate them. Because if this was a matter of just sending it to a first reading, I would be comfortable with that. Um, you know, so I, I don't know how people feel like that we could table that until we find that answer or have a special meeting just to do that. But um, anyway, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable still. Councilor Bailey. I um, think that uh, in order to move this forward, I think that if it could be broken down into two conversations, the first is um, if Councilor um, Hayes could receive or all of us receive the supporting documentation regarding the cost assumptions on the municipal side. And I understand that at some point before final approval, there would be some type of discussion about the validation of that uh, at whatever level it might be. Um, I would think I can. Personally, I think I can personally I can infer what the impact is based upon the presentation and based upon what the high points of the negotiations were um, and where we are. Um, but it needs to be shared with the public so that they understand that. The second is really a more substantive conversation, is that, and that is around what portion will be sheltered. Um, because I think it needs to be discussed and explained that no matter what portion you have, uh, whether it's in the sheltered portion or in the general fund, town council at that time will be the deciding body that decides how that is spent and what project is prioritized to be spent, which is a major conflict with what is being um, um, mentioned by citizens who talk about that. So I think that needs to be clarified from a legal perspective based upon our own charter. And Because the fact is, is that if the numbers, if some people are confused by the numbers and it's above their pay grade, can you imagine what the conversation is going to be like around what portion should be sheltered? Mm -hmm. uh, I could come in and say it should be 10%, you could say 25%. And there's real no basis of what number that you're truly picking and why you're picking it. Um, because we won't know what projects will be prioritized <coughs> at that time because we won't know what's needed today in five years or seven years when that's happening. So I think there needs to be a more substantive conversation around that part. Um, and then maybe just briefly go over the data that Councillor Hayes is asking for um, so that it can be shared with the public at the same time and maybe break it into two. From, from, a, from a conversation perspective, I'm okay with it being together. but. Thank you. So there were a couple other components of the um, agreement that I, I think that we talked about, but we haven't really uh, fleshed out, we haven't seen yet. And, and that one of them was around uh, transfer, um, should, the, should the land be sold. Um, and I, I really, I'm hesitant to say let's, 
let's have the workshop on 1017, but sk have the material read ready and then have the work or the hearing on the 24th. I mean, my, my strong preference would be have the workshop, talk about it, gives the, the public another opportunity for uh, input, and then we schedule the hearing. And I get that that slows down that schedule slightly, but if we did that workshop and discussion on the 17th, you know, we could schedule that hearing on the 28th or 29th or whatever, whatever 10, days, 10 days after that. Um, and that would be my really strong preference. Thank you. D just appreciate we need time to draft documents. Um, yes. I, I suppose we could get the majority of that done and kind of fill in the, the blanks, if you will. But uh, that's a component that we're working with. Doesn't that, doesn't that give you more time? I mean, I thought that they would do on the 14th, not, not the It does, 17th. presuming that we could start now as opposed to waiting until after the workshop and then start then. Oh, well, my expectation is we'd be looking at a draft of that workshop the, of what you would have okay. put out on And then hopefully at that point we're just tweaking going to be, yeah, yeah fair enough, I, I, yeah, we aren't on track to meet that deadline. What would, the, what would that schedule look like to, to you? Tom, you may have a thought on, on that as well. Well, we obviously the bare, bare minimum need to respect the 10-day notice requirement, so uh, I, I guess in the interest of time, you'd probably schedule well, you could take action on the 17th, it's your regular public meeting, to do that. Um, would have to search for available space. I don't know what the consequence of further delay is to the developer, whether that's a consideration you should even be aware of, but um, that's what's really driving this schedule at this point. If we had our druthers, we would certainly have more time to deal with all these matters. And I, I don't want to make their case for them. Uh, I, if, if that's a interest and concern, you want to let them make that case. Councilor Keza, then Councilor Kyrene. So to Councilor Rohn's point, if I think, I, I recall we, we did have a discussion, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the, any CEAs are transferable unless both parties agree to dissolve them, and in which case we wouldn't be on the hook for any of the requirements. That's my understanding, and they wouldn't receive any of the benefits from it, but I thought, my understanding was, and if I'm not mistaken, that they are transferable to, to whoever owns the property. Uh, if, I could, uh, if I could, if I could. Do you want to respond, respond to that? Yeah, so my, my understanding was when we were, had a discussion with council, was that there there could be a, it would have to come back to the council on, to approve the, the transfer. Uh, my understanding is only if they wanted to get out of it. Well, yeah, it's a change in contract. Right. We've not negotiated that point uh, so, you know, specifically, but um, I, I have a pretty good sense that uh, there, they would they would wish it to be assignable. Uh, if it does require some level of town consent, that it, it uh, shouldn't be unreasonably withheld. So there would need to be, that's the typical approach. Uh, but again, those points have not been negotiated in fine detail yet. Councilor Kettering. Is there some reason we couldn't um, have this hearing on November 7th? Rather than the 24th of October, it's just too. It's too late. What do you mean? I I think there is no uh, no reason other than uh, the desire uh, to move the matter forward. But it sounds like there's a step in between now and the public hearing that several councillors have expressed an interest in seeing happen. Right, but you would do your 17th workshop, but have this. In other words, uh, amend this m motion here to be November 7th, and then do your workshop on the 17th, and we'll have more info. Mm -hmm. It's not, because yeah. I, I have absolutely no desire to push this off forever, because um, I, I do know, you know, I work with developers and whatever in my job, and I mean, they have time constraints too. So not that that matters to me particularly, but does just because it's the right thing to do, if nothing else. But I also have taxpayers and I have constituents and myself. Um, I just feel I agree with my fellow counselors that we need a bit more time to make sure we've got things in place. That's how I'm feeling. <clears throat> Others offering a voice on moving uh, the date back to November 7th. 
Can't say bye bye. If that was in the form of a motion to amend the primary motion, I will second that. I will make that a motion then. I will second. Uh, the motion to amend discussion. Uh, others, Chris? Yeah, I, I, I'm confused. So you want to move the process along, but you want to postpone the hearing from the 24th to the yep. 7th? You get it. Those are counterproductive, though, right? I know, you that's you do realize that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think, Councilor uh, uh, Bayway. Um, so, uh, why I'm supporting this is that I do believe it needs to move forward. Um, second is that um, as the process moves forward and we have our workshops or have our other sessions and whatever it might entail, um, we can always go to that meeting on the 7th uh, or whatever the agenda item uh, and, and actually ask to table the motion and push it out even further if we must. I mean, th there is remedies to if the timeline doesn't fit. We don't have to make a decision on that particular date. or I mean, So I'm, I'm okay with it because the council can always change it and push it out another week or two or whatever it might be carries risk, but I'm just saying that from a procedural and from a process perspective, there's nothing wrong with pushing it out the two weeks. Uh, would councilors wish to hear from uh, uh, Mr. Rosvera uh, on the consequence of pushing the date from the 24th to the 7th of November? Nope. Sure. Rocky? Yeah, I think I've heard it all say. already. <laughs> At the risk of sending my brother Bill up here. <laughs> <laughs> Time frames aren't going to hurt us. Uh, I didn't share it a little while ago. Peter asked me not to share it. I'm going to go against what he, what he asked me to say. Got an email on my way here tonight. A decision will have to be made by this team very likely Friday on the biggest user we have potentially for the light industrial part. Not really sure. I'm positive it's coming. The email said we would be talking on Friday. Uh, so that's a that's a real uh, conundrum for us. Um, it's us or another town. It's us or another town, and that that's that's a fact. Um, and you know we want to push to have it here. Obviously, it's it's hugely important to us. So. Um, time, time is going to hurt us, folks. And I've been saying it, I've been preaching it for a couple of months now. Time is important to us. Our users are here now, and we want to move forward with the probably part, the, the best part of the project, or, or the best ROI model that's immediately in front of us is, is right within our grasp, and I need your help to get there, and the time frame is a problem for us. And I can't say any more than that. So how about those paths? We're going to beat the Colts. The, uh, from the discussion, it <coughs> appears that uh, there's pretty wide support for having a session before the public hearing that would uh, discuss uh, both the TIF, uh, elements of the TIF, as well as a allocation of funds that would uh, emanate from the credit enhancement agreement. Uh, Tom Manager and I just discussed that we could schedule a workshop to have that discussion uh, before the 24th. And therefore, in deference to uh, uh, the Scarborough Downs people, try to stay on that schedule of the 24th, but we need to have that session between now and the 24th. Frankly, I think it would need to be next Wednesday at the 10th uh, for us to have any hope to be able to get, have time to draft the documents. Chris. However, the motion on the floor is for November right. 7th, not October 24th. And that's why, I, because we're discussing whether to vote for the amended right. motion. Right. And so the question is, 
if the alternative is to hold a workshop on October 10th uh, 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 so as to have ourselves feeling more grounded on, on both the TIF and the allocation of funds, then uh, you would vote against the amendment and uh, the main motion would then be the 24th. Well, can, can I ask a question about that? plan, I remember this is not the issue on the table, but would we be able to, could we have the workshop and then schedule the uh, hearing at that point? I mean, could we do that on the 10th? That gives us more than 10 days, um, and we don't have to make a decision tonight. We can see how that goes. Session. Yeah, I mean, you have to notice it as a special meeting at yeah. the end of the workshop, so you, you could take action. I think the answer is that if we have a workshop on October 10th, uh, we could set the public hearing date for the 24th if we come out of the, here, of the <coughs> workshop on the 10th feeling that it's an appropriate date. Mr. Chair, um, uh, I can't even talk. Councilor Kayazo and I have commitments to the Long Range Planning Committee on the 10th. I think this would supersede that. I know, but I'm just saying. And I think that's what will happen, Councilor Gitterine, is this would supersede it. Okay, I'm looking at Jay. <laughs> and just you heard it from these guys. Just to put a finer point on the schedule, um, we have set an internal deadline. I, I suppose we can work through the weekend, but uh, we must have all documents finalized by Friday the 12th in order to make the 10-day notice requirement uh, for the 24th. So that would give us two days to finalize. Now, I suspect we would use time between now and then to prepare much of them, and we'd modify based on the direction that comes out of that workshop, so we, we don't have to do all the work after it, but, um... Councillor <clears throat> I guess I'm, uh, and if it's appropriate, I'm a little confused because if they have to make a decision by Friday, then I don't it's understand how our timeline so. matters. And, and with all due respect, and I do mean it with all due respect, I can't make a decision this big for the town um, based on, on what they need. I, I'm very comfortable. I, I feel like the November 7th was a compromise and a, a way to get, keep it moving without, uh, and give us the time. It, you know, to Mr. Hall's point earlier, he's like, well, I can't get the documents done. <laughs> well, if you can't get the documents done, then we can't review them and do our due diligence. And all of these things have to come together. Right. And we have to be moving and working on this together. And it feels like we're trying to make something, again, we have all the right pieces, but we're trying to make something fit that doesn't feel like it is part of our plan and doesn't fit on the fly. So I'm supportive of the motion on the floor uh, to move to the seventh. I uh, would not be in favor of the alternative plan being sidelined discussed. Councilor Rowan, thank you. So I, I would also offer an alternative, uh, which is if. Excuse me more. If, if <laughs> just for Katie's benefit, uh, would be. Um, I mean, if the documents are going to be ready on the 12th, we could meet on the 12th and then make a decision. We still have 10 days. If we so chose, if we said at that point we were ready, um, we could we could have that um, scheduled hearing at that time. Uh, if we're not ready, then we don't schedule the hearing. It, it becomes a later date. We don't have to decide tonight what that schedule is. Yeah, uh, just to, just to be clear, I, I that we're not on any different timeline. Um, to the extent that there are changes that come out of the workshop on the 10th, we would need to make final modifications in a couple of days. But uh, that's really no different timeline than, frankly, we're committing to at this point. Um, the, the date of the public hearing, the notice requirement, is, uh, those are all still the same. Okay. So, so um, I feel like I'm chasing my own tail. Um, in this conversation, so I did need to uh, ask a clarifying question to the manager because I thought that there were some constraints regarding either analysis, uh, preparation, documentation, whatever other pieces might have been. So that's why I suggested in supporting Councillor uh, Katarina's uh, moving the public hearing piece up because we needed more time to be able to absorb right. that. But if you're able to complete that and we do our job and uh, due diligence, um, I don't have a problem with drawing the motion. I thought it was because there was a issue with um, preparing information and us being able to disseminate it. It depends what information you're talking about. We could use more time in drafting the documents? Absolutely. I, 
I would say that. We can meet this requirement if we must. If there are additional information that we want to provide to the public or engage an independent consultant, all those things matter to the schedule. And so those are the things that I don't have um, clear direction on. And I hope this doesn't come to light of heart. I don't need to see the documents. I need to see the analysis about where we're going to set the TIF. That's more important than the legal language is going to be in the documentation. Well, it's necessary before a final approval. It's not necessary before a public hearing. So I need to understand the analysis. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see um, the uh, supporting analysis regarding the cost piece that can be distributed and shared, the final piece, and then the conversation piece because documentation, legal agreements, we can evaluate that between the public hearing and the final. In my opinion, that's apparently my opinion. So I'm willing to withdraw the November 7th if there's an agreement. <laughs> no, but I did. I can withdraw my second. Not yet. <laughs> Peter. My second. No. no, I'm sort of confused, and it sort of, as a clarification of what the town manager asked, I didn't know if we had agreement, but I thought we'd gotten to the point of saying we did want to, you had committed to having an independent analysis done of the financial model by the software engineer. And I thought we had agreed that we were going to do some type of financial analysis. I mean, we're out sharing numbers right now if those numbers change. Um, it, so when would that work be completely best case? Because I think before we hit decision making and before we hit a public hearing, the community needs some time to see those documents and digest those documents so they can give us their feedback. I have not committed to a full-blown independent evaluation of all the analyses. What I have said is we will re-engage the consultant that created the model that we used and solicit the software, his right? The software model? Yes. But not, but, but you're not committing to a funny independent financial analyst. Unless the council full council direct. I know you keep saying it, but I haven't heard the full council direct that that's what they want. If they do, I think that sets this in a different course, of a different direction. I'm pleased to work in that regard. I just need clear direction. Chris, so uh, m maybe if it helps, uh, splitting the question to because we're talking about TIF and and how much we're going to use for the TIF and now the CEA is creeping in again with separate analysis on, you know, are we going to complete the third party analysis? Could, could we at least agree that the, the discussion on the 10th will be centered around the TIF in general, the workshop in general, uh, and and I mean we're still working towards the CEA language anyway, right? So would we be able to have a TIF only discussion on the 10th with uh, some kind of background to say what does it mean to shelter, what can we use if we shelter the money for, what are the restrictions, and then have that discussion so that we set the TIF language on the 10th, and that of course will give more time to do the CEA analysis as well. Does that make sense? Instead of trying to do both at the same time, because you're running, if I, unless I'm mistaken again, we've got two issues, two questions, right? We've got the TIF question. And what are we going to do for splits? Is it all going to the general fund, or are we going to shelter any of that? That's one question, and that's one analysis we need to look at, or one, one set of definitions we need to look at. And then the second question or issue that strikes me that we're having is, are we going to do the third-party analysis, or are we going to have the consultant do it, or is it going to be independent, or are we going to just run another set of numbers with ours, Wh whatever that direction is going to be? That's a separate question mm -hmm. for the council, right? So can we at least agree that the TIF should be looked at with the splits and how we're going to do that on the 10th? Is the, uh, uh, is the public hearing requirement applicable to both the TIF district and the credit enhancement agreement? No, it's really the TIF specific. But since we have this agreement in, in front of us, I, I, I think it would be, uh, we'd be remiss not to, and we have, share the details of that and be prepared to listen to public comment regarding that but it's not a requirement of the statute. There's okay. typically delegated authority for the council to approve future credit enhancement agreements. Those don't go, this one will not go to DCD for approval. It, it is a local agreement. Good. Peter. Peter. Just point, I, I don't know where it fits, but I think the two questions, I think Tom asked a question about, and I'm not sure where it fits the order of what we're considering. I would like to have the council take a vote on whether we agree that we'll have an independent financial analysis or not just by a show of hands, or so it's clear. Is that a motion? Uh, we're running a no, motion right now. Right. Yeah, yeah, I know, so that's why I said where it fits, but right. I, mean, like, <laughs> I would like to we'll, decide that tonight, because yeah, it we'll, impacts timing. We'll, take, we'll, we'll 
do that uh, as a straw poll because that will affect people's judgment on timing. timing. So, do we have an estimate of how long that might take, or do we want to put a, a time limit on that? I don't. I, I've not explored what resources are available, much less what time or cost is associated. What what's uh, what was described earlier was that uh, we have a cost analysis done by the set code director, uh, and uh, uh, a person with considerable skill. Uh, we're also going to check with the people who created the program that allows the cost analysis to be done. Karen, do you want to speak to that? Just a quick clarification. Um, the person who, or the team who wrote the model, those guys are planners and the person who actually um, did develop it um, has, is a financial analysis with respect to, to uh, municipality. So he he does check off the box of being an expert. He's not just a, um, a he's not a software engineer. In fact, he is a a, a planner and a financial planner um, with respect to municipality. So I just wanted to make that clear. Don't know. Well, the, does well, that do mean both. that uh, we'll have a um, a, fi a financial financial analyst? with familiarity with this software program uh, doing a review of the work that you have done? If we check in with, with Matt, the, the person who developed the uh, <clears throat> model as it is, he is the one who developed the model who is, um, that we based most of our analysis on. What we've done is um, some, uh, we've updated the numbers to, well, there's a whole list of things that I, I believe uh, um, is on the um, the website now. There's a whole list of things that we've done, and what Tom is or what the manager is suggesting is that let's go back to the the people who wrote the the model in terms of the um, financial piece and understanding how municipalities work, and have him uh, both go through sort of the the checks that we or the the approach that we took in updating those those numbers. I just want to make sure that I'm correct. And so that person is not just a, a software engineer. He is a, a, a planner. Thank you. Councilor Gatorino. Mr. Chair, move the question. <laughs> so uh, that's that not debatable. Discussion. That's not debatable, I believe. I believe uh, is not debatable the councilor that made the motion is, is able to make that motion and is not seven. available. Yep. And that's so, on just the amendment, by the way. That's, that's just on the motion to amend. Not that's on the, the only that's not on the straw poll of Correct. whether no, no, that's, what yeah, we're going way Karen over. Martin described Correct. as opposed to what Peter no, no, described. No, 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 I'm talking about the amendment I made to schedule public hearing for Wednesday, November 7th. Okay. Uh, no further discussion? Uh, yes. All in favor? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What, what are we voting? Oh. Uh, November, November 7th. Sorry, She's moving the question. Yes. Yeah, she moved the question. She moved the, question, moved the question, and therefore the motion to amend was no, to, no, uh, is yeah. before us. Right. And, it fails. Right. and the motion to amend is to put the date uh, for the public hearing on November 7th. All in favor. All understand? All in favor? All opposed? Four to three. So the date, uh, the, mo the main motion as amended uh, is November 7th. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of, before we take that vote, as a straw poll, uh, Karen Martin described a certain level of uh, oversight and independent analysis. Peter described a, <coughs> what it sounded like a more extensive analysis. Uh, uh, I'm gonna ask you to select one or the other. Can, uh, I, could, can I ask a question of Ms. Martin certainly, before? Certainly, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that software engineers are very talented individuals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't mean to course. say just. I didn't mean to say just a software engineer. Okay. Uh, Let me clarify that. Uh, I stand corrected. 
That's all I want. <laughs> no, um, could you, could you, are they going to validate the inputs as well as the, the mechanics of the model? Is that, is that what you're, we're going to ask them to do? So we, we have updated um, some things. One of, the, one of the things we've done is, is gone from 2017 to 2019. The other thing that we have had to do, because the, the way the model is written, it doesn't do an iterative process. So we've had to step outside the software and build a year-by-year -year model. So that's one of the things that we can certainly ask him to take a look at. Um, and I think there are a couple of assumptions that we've made. Um, we, for ease, well, there's a whole long list of things. And I think that's what we're talking about, having um, the uh, proprietor of the, or the developer of the model take a look at. Um, just to check us off the list, this is a reasonable scenario, a reasonable way to do this. Um, as we all know, there's probably a hundred ways, uh, different types of assumptions. So we're asking him to make sure that we uh, made some reasonable assumptions in terms of looking at the impacts of the dance. But the, but the, uh, the, the inputs to the, to the model come mm -hmm. from you know, expenses and such come from Correct. our budget. Correct. They came from our budget. And so did the original work that they did for us. Um, when they did the original model, they were <coughs> using, they were just using 2017 numbers. And what we're using are 2019. And in your experience, is it typical for a model like this to be independently verified before somebody says it's appropriate? Um, this model was built this model was built to run alternative scenarios. So the whole reason to have this is to test different, different assumptions. Um, and really that's what we've been doing. We've been um, changing assumptions. We've been um, uh, going through and looking at different rates of tax increases and different rates of uh, property tax or valuation increases. So certainly he can take a look at that and say, well, that was either not a good structure to work with or not. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Uh, but yeah, he's, they, they did the, the structure by which we built the individual um, year models, the 30 years. Each, we built a model for each year, basically. Um, the assumptions that we did, the way in which it was constructed, follows what they were doing. Um, one of the only differences, the major difference is probably that we took a net budget instead of taking, um, having the numbers generate both revenues and, um, and costs. So we, we looked at the budget and said, all right, well, we're going to take these revenues out because we're not going to generate them separately. Uh, town manager needs direction uh, on this, so uh, I think a straw poll would be appropriate. Katie. Oh, sorry. Well, I don't know if it was appropriate or not, but I was just going to say, if I have to choose either or, I have an opinion, but I'd prefer both. <laughs> so, Chris. So, are you I guess I'm, is, the, is the analysis going to be on the methodology of the calculations or the actual software iterations as it's not iterating and it's not doing its software function. So is it, a, mm -hmm. is it a methodology assessment to being that we're using the right methodology and the right analysis and the right, the right emphasis on the right parameters? Or is it just a software evaluation to see we want it to do its calculations on its own? We're not talking, to me, we're not talking about a software evaluation. Again, because we've actually rebuilt um, components of this outside of the traditional model. So he's looking at our methodology and how we, well, he would be, look at the methodology in terms of what we did, um, look at the parameters of the, the um, updates that we did, um, and you know, make some uh, general assessment of, um, I guess, the, the projection methods. I, I do have to remind us that you know, I think we, we were all participating in the decision on using 3% as the tax rate increase and a couple of those things. Um. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Peter. It's really just kind of, like, if I hear you right, I mean, we bought software, you made some modifications mm -hmm. to the software. 
I totally understand that they're going to look at that to make sure the modifications that you made, because you, I mean, I've been around software for a sure. while. F software never works out of the box. There's always stuff. And if you change code, I think we'll take exception to that. Well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, Except for Will's <laughs> software. Will's always works. But, yeah. but, but I hear you. But my question becomes, I think it builds on purses. What I was thinking about is, should we have used net present value? Are we using the right economic assumptions in driving the $280 million in net revenue mm -hmm. we're saying we're going to have? I think we need a a professional financial planner that does that type of work, which I think is different than the resource you're talking to. It is. Yes. It is it very is. different. Yes. So, so I, I think they're two really <coughs> clearly different things, right. but, but I wasn't clear that that's where. And I also think that, that there's a, a difference between um, trying to use a set of numbers as guideposts and say, we've never, we've never done this type of analysis, what we've done is say, we know how things were built or how things worked in, you know, 2019, <coughs> and we're going to try me. to take the Downs development and do a reasonable projection, a region, reasonable um, application of the current budget to that. Um, and we haven't done anything more fancy than that. Um, if what you're saying is, um, we require some other level of analysis, that's, that's different. Um, but I think what we're trying to do is say, given what we know about the town, given what we know um, about the current expenses, did we make some reasonable assumptions uh, about what those impacts could be? And then I think, just to be clear, I think one of the, the, the powerful messages in some of the um, information that we've done is say, let's ensure that we have given ourselves breathing room um, within those projections. And I think that's where we come back to looking at, um, again, this is probably past the scope here of what you wanted to hear. Um, but I think, there, again, we're, what we're trying to do is do a reasonableness test on what we think the potential cost could be. I think if you're going to ask somebody to come in and say, this is exactly what those costs are going to be, we can't get there. Um, so it's really common sense approach. And I think that the issue is, um, I think we've laid it out there before, we've had it on some of the information, we've talked about it um, in some of the exec executive sessions of what we did and what assumptions we made. So among you guys, you could decide you could say, well, I don't, these are not assumptions that we agree with. Um, and that's fine. You know, we, we made um, reasonable assumptions uh, based on the information that we were being given um, and input from, from the council. So I'll stop talking now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, any further comments before we just take a straw poll on which direction we're going to go in giving the town manager direction? as to the further cost analysis by an outside source. Uh, any further questions? Uh, Are you going to structure this? Yeah, could you structure the, the question? Or, uh, there are options. Reasonable well, you've got two, one sentence. You, you've got two choices. Uh, Peter described a certain independent financial mm -hmm. analysis. We all heard what he said. Right. Karen described a uh, analysis uh, that would be checking her work mm -hmm. by the people okay. who built the system to do a cost analysis. <coughs> uh, so uh, those who would prefer... But there's a third question, Mr. Chairman, is that someone disagrees with that, those, both of those questions and believes that we have confidence in our staff. And go for neither. And go for neither. So there's really three questions. Uh, all right, let's we'll have, start out by... Uh, I've got more nuance as well. Maybe we just go around and we could give a one-sentence answer. Okay. <laughs> Let's start at the end of the table. It, it, just to be clear, I've already initiated reconnecting yep. with our consultant. That will happen, and I believe that turnaround will be fairly prompt. Sure. Um, I do not agree with outsourcing um, a analysis, um, and the reason is that um, I believe we're trying to justify why other assumptions are not being used, and I don't find that valuable to the conversation because there's just disagreement about assumptions within the analysis. So I have confidence, very high level of confidence with our staff 
um, and their experience and expertise in, in this type of issue. So I do not support sending this out. Councilor Rowan. So we're talking about uh, predicting the future 30 years from now. I would be delighted to get another professional opinion just to look at it. I, I think that that would not be harmful. But however, I'd be uh, interested or I guess my, my concern would be around the, the cost and the amount of time that it would take to do that. So I, I would say that um, <coughs> very qualified um, qualified support for out, outside analysis. Which level? The one that Peter described, or the one that right. so, Karen so, described? So I would say let's let's do the one that we that we have underway, and let's investigate how much it would cost and how long it would take to do the the more uh, uh, the uh, more. Uh, independent third party. Vote. I am mostly aligned with what Will just articulated very well that I can't repeat. And secondly, would just add really what I want more than anything is somebody to look at what the Downs team did, look at what Karen did and said, yes, I agree. That all looks right and accurate to me. And then I can feel really good and confident about going, let's go forward. Councilor Katerina. Independent analysis is fine with me. Councilor Hayes. Independent analysis, and I would suggest Steve Brand, who did the growth projections, he, he did this all day long, every day. This was his career at Hannaford, is to do economic projections of where to build supermarkets. I bet he could turn it around pretty quickly. Yeah, pretty I don't even have a conversation with him regarding that, but that's good to know. Councilor Kaza. Neither. That was an option. Neither. I think the, the leaning is towards uh, retaining. Uh, an expert beyond the uh, software program personnel. Mm -hmm. That would be my sense of, of this. Uh, and we have a relationship with Steve Brin. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would have to agree. I don't think it would hurt whatsoever if Mr. Right. Brin has the all the qualities needed yeah. uh, and Peter having done this sort of work, would say that it can be done within a reasonable period of time. Yeah. So, uh, so I think that's the direction that the town manager wanted to have, uh, which now brings us to uh, the amended motion. I'm sorry, it was, it was both, though, motion. correct? We still want to make sure that we didn't... Yes, it'll be both. Because we've already put in place uh, a discussion with the manufacturer of the software program. We have a motion okay. to amend. No, you have a main motion no, that's no, been amended. We're done. Yes, yeah. so now we're voting on yes. the main motion as amended. Oh, which, to hold it to November 7th. Which places the date on November 7th. Okay. Further discussion no. on the motion as amended? <laughs> well, so I have no problem with doing this on the 7th. I, uh, my concern is that we don't need to decide tonight uh, because we would have more than enough notice. Um, between now and the seventh to, to schedule that here. Uh, we, and, we, and we could do it as early as a workshop on the 10th. Huh? We just uh, need 10 days, right? That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you're correct. We could put it off, but why would we necessarily put it off? If we have it scheduled, uh, it's then there as a target for the staff to work towards. Other comments? This is a discussion on the motion, main motion as amended. Katie. Uh, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, what Councilor Rowan was getting at was that we could, in fact, potentially do it earlier if, the, if Steve Brin is able to turn this things, these things around because uh, we would have, you know, oh. only a 10-day window. So I, is that what you were kind no, of getting no, at? That was mine. So I would be yeah. open to... You know, moving forward with the seventh, but with the opportunity to move it fat sooner if we get the right, if we had things in advance, I, is that see from a scheduling point of view? Hmm. Challenging, okay. yeah, I get it. <laughs> I guess we got I to schedule that's what you were trying to special meeting for whenever you convene in, in a to discuss these other matters and make that decision that evening. That would be on October 10th, special meeting. Uh, which gives us a week to further find out where we are, in which case uh, we would table the motion uh, that's presently on. Uh, just kill it. it. 
Forgive me, it just occurred to me, we did research the availability of these chambers on the 10th. There's the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting at 7. Right. We were intending to do a workshop at 6 and be out of here in an hour. So <coughs> uh, we've got space challenges if, if 10th is your date. Could go earlier. Council Mayor It's given the high level of confidence that we can commit Mr. Bren to a time schedule. I agree with Mr. Rowan that um, if we can have a conversation on the 10th and it uh, allows us to actually make a decision before the 7th, I, I think that we could wait until the 10th or whatever the date is, whatever date we choose, whether it's the 10th, the 9th, whatever. Um, I'm happy to, uh, I'm going to vote against this and just ask that it be gone until that meeting. Further comments? Uh, I think the, uh, the point being made to my right is that uh, a special town council meeting held on the 10th would afford us the opportunity to meet the 10-day deadline for a date earlier than November 7th if we had that kind of financial analysis. It therefore affords us a little more flexibility than simply voting tonight on November 7th. And keep in mind that the information could push it out to the 7th or push it out to a different day too. So uh, on, we would notice the meeting on the 10th to uh, schedule a public hearing. We're just not sure at this point what that date would be. And that would result from a discussion uh, that we would have as the town manager has a clearer idea of what, what sort of deadlines can be met. Point of clarification, just a question. So if we vote no on this as amended, then we're not scheduling tonight, we're not scheduling the public hearing, we're just gonna wait. Yeah, that's right. No, the motion was to amend the date. I think you still need to act on the main motion. No, oh, whatever. Still pending. Well, the main the main <laughs> motion. The, the main motion is now amended. Fair enough. Okay. And right. so, uh, so this if we final. if we that vote tonight to defeat this main motion as amended, then, uh, then no, no date has been right. set. Okay. And we and the consensus of the town council is to schedule. Uh, uh, a special town council meeting on October 10th. No. To set Again, the date. I just, I just caution you that this space is not available that night, so if you wish to have a workshop, uh, I'm not quite sure where we'll have that on the 10th. And so. we may have to do it in B. Uh, no, absolute voting. voting will be in full swing at that point. It's not like we haven't had town council meetings elsewhere. We could yeah. do it at a fire barn. We could well, do yeah, it. We may have to do uh, Wentworth. We could do it anywhere. Else. But we'll find space. If I could be so bold, and I don't usually do this, I'm not even sure if i permitted to speak during discussion, but it strikes me there's some value, though September date is not necessarily attractive to the developer, you've heard that, there's maybe value in giving them some certainty what that date is as opposed to a question mark still. Right. Uh, equally important, um, putting a stake in the ground for the public might be helpful as well. Um, and I appreciate Councilor's comments that it may be sooner I really think that that's really hard to believe in my mind. Um, so in I, I just in think which it case, might, might be value in fixing a date and working toward that date. Good. Council Foley. I, I would say, given the commitment to both analysis, as long as we have that information in, in plenty of, I'm fine with going back to the 24th now. Because I, that was my concern, was that we still weren't going to have. I can't give any commitments yeah. for the 24th. I think uh, the town uh, manager's suggestion was okay. if we set the 7th, some certainty uh, would oh, exist right. as to when it would be held, which, while I think Rocky made it clear that he's under the gun a bit, uh, if we make no decision, it puts him more under the gun. That's what we're trying to do. Councilor Caterina. I, I, I'm sitting here thinking this through, and I, uh, I, I've wavered back and forth in the last two minutes. Uh, I think we should stick with the seventh for the reasons enumerated by uh, Cou uh, Councillor Hall. I almost called you Manager <laughs> Hall. Um, that you know, a date certain it makes it very clear for everybody what we're working towards, when it's going to happen. The public knows, uh, the developer knows. I have every reason to believe that Mr. Rizbara and his cohorts are really good negotiators, and can keep that person on the line if it's only a little bit longer, I hope. Um, but that being said, I, I really I feel strongly that we should vote to have it the, the 7th. Keep it the 7th. 
Keep it clean. Councilor Caso. Hope and faith are no means of a good strategy. I won't support the motion. Other, other comments? Are we ready to vote? We're going to miss you. Uh, this is a vote on the main motion as amended to change the date to November 7th. All in favor? Opposed? Passes. It's uh, said. You. And we will schedule uh, an October 10th, and, and the town manager and I will work on the space issue. Thank you for uh, your patience. Uh, Questions. Do we, do we still need to do the 10th, though? I mean, we wouldn't need to have a special yeah, meeting now the without the no. conference. Date to be determined okay. sooner than later. Yes. Uh, order number 1868. Uh, first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 1401, Coastal Waters and Harbor Ordinance, Article Roman Number 5, regulations concerning anchoring, mooring, and security of vessels. Section 1A, placement of private moor moorings, and I would ask the Mr. Chairman, committee you chair. chair. Mr. Chairman, my apology. Yeah, I think you went out of, I don't think you we drove 67 yet. 1067. Oh, that's Signed. right. Yeah. Thank you. 18067. First reading and refer to the planning board that proposed amendments to Chapter 405, Zoning Ordinance, Section Roman Numeral 12, Sign Regulations, Subsection J, Temporary Signs. Ordinance Committee Chair will report this out. I sure will. <laughs> um, we met in ordinance. I hear over and over and over again, particularly now that uh, political season has begun, um, that, oh, this sign's wrong and that sign's not in the right place and whatever, whatever. So what we decided to do um, is to bring the town of Scarborough ordinance language in line with the state of Maine which includes recent changes to total number of weeks allowed from six weeks, is now increased to 12 weeks, and that's in a calendar year. <coughs> Excuse me, will no longer require a phone number, and instead will just require an address, which is what lines up with the state, um, and requiring the date that the sign was erected within the right of way. And that, those are the changes being proposed. Thank you. Uh, uh, public comment on uh, 18067. Please approach the podium. Paula O'Brien, Pondview Drive. I bet you're all happier that I'm speaking and not sending emails. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, I got a call earlier this afternoon, or late this afternoon, and um, I think it was in response to a, an email I sent earlier regarding a couple of signs in red zones. And apparently the police department was dispatched to remove some signs. And I think it was an honest mistake on the part of the police department. However, um, I did speak to a couple of um, homeowners and signs were improperly removed from their private residences. Um, and that's a violation obviously of their constitutional right to freedom of speech. So I did speak with one of the homeowners all along there. Um, I did notice on my way home, I didn't see any signs on either side of the road along the whole, between Minuteman and Hackmatack. So um, you may want to reword that. But the homeowners that had um, two of their signs removed were extremely upset, senior citizens, um, and told the, and I quote, nice woman police officer um, that you can't take those signs, this is private property, and they apparently said, told the homeowner they were instructed to do so by the chief. And again, I think it was an honest mistake, but I think those signs should be returned to the homeowners as soon as possible. But you might wanna, maybe the wording has to be changed somehow regarding the Pleasant Hill Preserve. What, what you're indicating is that signs on the south side of uh, Pleasant Hill Road uh, uh, across the street from Pleasant Hill Preserve were removed. It was on the same side of the road. On the same side as Pleasant Hill Preserve? Right, but down, like, um, once you, fog is on your right, and once you keep going down, mm -hmm. there's houses on the left there. And it was those houses that were removed. And then after I spoke with the homeowner, because I, I wanted to um, 
you know, make sure on my own that the information I received was correct. So I wanted to speak with the homeowner personally. And um, then on my way home, I happened to notice that there were signs on the other side of the road too that I didn't see anymore. So I'm not positive if those were confiscated or not, but I had seen them before because I traveled through there for work. I'm just guessing that maybe they were removed from both sides. I think that the police department that was dispatched misunderstood the ordinance, so, but I think they should be returned because they were. We'll ask the uh, town clerk uh, to address that. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. And I'm glad to see the changes taking effect. It yeah, will save a you. lot for everybody's time. Further comment? Good evening, Ben Howard, 4 Oakdale Drive. Um, I actually came to speak on another section of the sign ordinance, specifically the section in regards to the seven intersections with the 30-foot ban. Um, as I spoke to this topic over a year ago, um, referencing police data as the idea was for public safety, safety not to allow these signs, um, and the police data showed that there wasn't any real statistical evidence that said that these temporary signs uh, increased the number of accidents in town. And being this is the second political season that this ordinance has existed where these uh, sections of temporary signs are not to be placed and signs are continually placed day to day and not taken care of, the current ordinance is punishing those that understand and follow the ordinance while rewarding those that may not be familiar with the ordinance or just choose not to follow the ordinance as a whole. I am asking that the council and the ordinance committee go back and potentially remove this section of the ordinance as order just for easy significance. Tonight, there were 10 signs in the Hannaford intersection. Uh, I know at least two of them were local candidates for office. To me, this is just very unfair for individuals that do and are familiar with the ordinance and it is something as simple as just removing it. So I again will reiterate, please remove this uh, section of the ordinance so that signs can be placed there because obviously the public is not familiar enough uh, with it to properly place signs and it is punishing those that are familiar with it uh, to not have their political signs at these available locations. And again, to reference the court case from 1972 where the judge says temporary signs are the cheapest form of political advertisement, not <coughs> being able to place them at these high trafficked intersections put those individuals at a huge disadvantage to those that are, pl are currently placing them and that it cannot obviously be policed fast enough. Thank you. Further comments on the uh, sign ordinance matter before us? None. Oh, this is a first reading and referral to the planning board. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Councillor Katarina, you're the chairman. Why don't I <laughs> give you first shot? Yeah, um, I certainly understand what uh, the speaker, uh, Mr. Howard, uh, talked about that was discussed in committee. I just talked to the town clerk and others um, who actually are in charge of making sure signs are taken care of and they decided that they wanted to keep that 30 foot so um, for now anyway it looks like it, it, it will stay um, we're doing the best we can with picking them up we've got I believe it's the, v the VIPs are going around looking at, <laughs> at Tracy um, is it once a, I'm sorry through On the Wednesday. chair is it once a week or yeah yeah, Wednesday. once a week on Wednesdays and doing what we can to take care of signs. But I'm sure people, the taxpayers in town, don't want people spending all of their salary to, or paid time pulling signs either. So there's a fine balance. So, but just know that uh, we're trying to stay on top of it as best as we can. Mailers go out to all the candidates uh, and political action committees and whomever, and they're supposed to be following the rules. So. And I will remind people that while I appreciate you emailing me and texting me personally, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not allowed to pull signs. I'm not allowed to touch signs uh, that get a hold of uh, Toadie directly. Thanks. Councilor Gazel. 
So along those lines, um, I've had two experiences now where individuals um, have um, taken it upon themselves to relocate some or remove certain signs that are in the right of way. Um, and then the ensuing discussions are that the thought was that that was their property, that it wasn't the right of way, um, or that we still needed permission to put signs in the right of way. So I don't know how we clarify that, but um, if there was some form of clarifying and I don't know if that was the instance that, that Ms. O'Brien was speaking of where, um, you know, uh, it, it's it, it, oftentimes people think that their property line goes right to the curb, right sure. to the side of the road. They don't understand that there's a three-foot space that's, that's public. Um, yeah. I, and and I, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that, uh, uh, you know, if people have issues with signs in certain locations, um, there are phone numbers and contact information on the signs that they need to address that that way, not physically remove them or move them themselves. That's, that's a big challenge. Um, and I do think we'll make an effort to uh, <coughs> educate the uh, volunteer police who are doing this so that uh, that kind of accident doesn't happen. Yeah, and I'm not worried about the VIPs so much as I'm about private people thinking that it's their private, the property, and they're taking and they, it. And, and, they and they're taking them. it, right. Yeah. I, so that's more of a public education outreach type of thing that I'm, that I'm concerned with. Second thing I would say is I concur with, with um, Mr. Howard. Uh, you know, this wording is very cumbersome for anybody to try and figure out. 30 feet following the intersections by measured linearly from the point of tangent of the intersection. If you're not a geography or a geometry person, you don't know what that means. Could we please put some language in this that says we will put a, a physical mark on the curb, whether it's, yeah, where is, I couldn't find that anywhere in here that said there's a physical mark that it's going to be red, well, blue, What we did was we put a, uh, a picture, uh, a drawing, to, to show what it means. So we're going to change the colors. And, and so the, the okay. drawing's in there to show. So I'm, I might suggest we just add that to, the, to, to this saying. Uh, not beyond a certain marker on the curb, whether it's blue, orange, purple, yellow, whatever it is. Not beyond this point. So keep it simple so people understand, because okay. not just candidates are putting signs out, volunteers are as well, and you're, they don't understand you're saying the nuances. Make, in the ordinance, make reference to the fact Correct. that the curbing has yeah. demarcated right. that right. Nothing, nothing inside the intersection from the red line or the green line or blue, whatever yeah. it is, and it needs to be clearly marked on the curb. Okay. I think that's the onus is on us to do that. For, further comments? Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's my <laughs> biggest comment. I just, you know, hate that we even have to have this discussion. I love rolling it back and simplifying. Uh, I agree with Mr. Howard. I'd love to see a future ordinance committee take that on as well because I, I it just, it, it does, what's that word you used? Something in the craw. It, it burns me to, to know that our VIPs are spending that time. And I'm great. I'm glad we have a system. I think that's important and it makes it fair. Um, but I, I just think it's overly uh, complicated. And I like that we're aligning ourselves with the state rules. It makes it simpler for everybody. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Beba. So um, also I want to say thank you to the Ordinance Committee and the input that they received regarding this because I think that uh, whenever we make changes to um, ordinances and rules, we always have the best intentions and it takes time for us to understand and to um, accept that. I, I will say um, I'm a little, and, and I don't blame and don't want to change it at the local level because I like the fact that it matches up with the state. I don't agree with placing someone's address um, on a sign because the way today's society reacts to politics. Um, having been in a situation in which vandalism to some extent happened in one election cycle I was in, um, in which someone came to the house and put screw, screws in my uh, driveway, as well as um, even a phone number sometimes, um, and people understand, because believe me, I've had this conversation with the reporters, I don't want to give my place of employment, and they ask, well, who do you work for? Why? So that someone who doesn't like something that I do, so I think that there's a certain level of privacy that should happen, and that's an <laughs> argument that I'll take to the State House with me. <laughs> Other comments? This is uh, first reading. Uh, and schedule a public hearing. Uh, no, no the refer to the planning board. Are we ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Enacted. Order 1868. First reading, schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 1401, Coastal Waters and Harbor Ordinance. Regulations concerning anchoring, mooring, and security of vessels. Placement of private moorings, and this was this came out of the ordinance committee. I'll ask the ordinance chair to address this one. 
Uh, yes, uh, this actually began, uh, the former harbor master came to ordinance um, with, there's a number of issues with moorings and has been for quite a while. Um, <clears throat> we decided that it was best to refer this to my colleague, <laughs> Mr. Hayes, and the Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee, and they looked at it and suggested changes. And the uh, proposed changes received unanimous support by Coastal Waters and Harbors Committee. Uh, changes are including proof of boat registration and insurance prior to a mooring permit being issued. No more than two moorings issued to the same household. No more than three moorings issued to the same commercial entity. Uh, clarification that the sale of a boat does not include the sale of the mooring permit. Changes to mooring specs to match the City of Portland specs. Requirement for mooring gear inspection to read all mooring gear shall be inspected and or serviced by a mooring service company or by the owner with harbor master approval at least once biannually to determine condition of gear and to ensure compliance with minimum standards set forth by the um, ordinance. Um, boats must be moored by July 1st of the calendar year they have a moor mooring permit for or the permit will be revoked and codification of our mooring waitlist procedures, codification of notification of shared moorings to the harbor master, permission for the harbor master to require proof of commercial activity for commercial mooring applicants. Do you have anything to add that went on in more? They looked at it pretty clearly, it looked like thoroughly in we coastal did, and harbors. It would be a, a shout out to the assistant town manager, Larissa, sat through all those <laughs> and helped craft a lot of these things, but it really was was a result of there is just there's a long waiting list for moorings down there. It like really, ninety names on a waiting list. Yeah, and, and, and there were several people that had several moorings and it was really unclear about what the process is. So they, they it was really a great working committee. They worked really well together. Um, it's well thought out. They tried to simplify it. They tried to model what's going on in Portland. There were a lot of commercial commercial fishermen that also had boats in Portland. So it really simplified, made it cleaner, and, and I would wholeheartedly support it in the Coastal Harbor Committee. Good was, introduction was of the matter. Public, uh, anyone in the public wishing to comment on this matter? Please approach the podium. Accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Uh, Councilor Katerina. Uh, as a boat owner myself, uh, my husband and I own a company that uh, owns several moorings in Portland. I think these are awesome changes to the Scarborough mooring. Uh, when it first came to me, I looked at what they originally had. I'm like, what in the world? Yeah. So uh, I think it's a, a great uh, movement forward. Um, that, for people who aren't familiar with the waterfront down where most of the moorings are, it's a, it's, it's a difficult mooring situation to begin with because you have the river, you've got a lot of uh, tides in and out. There's not a whole lot of mooring space to begin with. So I think that this is going to be a good way to address this. I will also add for the uh, purpose of the council, I'm, um, I would like to have this, we're supposed to be setting a date for the public hearing. I would like to wait until November uh, 7th or even the second meeting in November. I don't know, I'm looking at Mr. Manager on this, to allow time for the current mooring permit owners to get proper, oops, excuse me, proper notification. I, I would suggest uh, if you have a specific date, you amend it into the, into the action. All right. Um, I don't have the thing right in front of me to amend it to November, to set the date for November 7th, November 7, 2018. Public hearing for November 7, 2018, enter that as an amendment. Uh, second, please. Second. Uh, discussion on the uh, motion to amend uh, to introduce the date of November 7th for the public hearing. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Uh, main motion, continuation of the discussion? Will? I'd like to uh, second two things that were said earlier. Um, the first was uh, thank you to the uh, Coastal Harbor Committee. You yeah. guys did a great job with it. It was really we were going to make a mess out of it in ordinance and, and uh, <laughs> recognize that, hey, we have this committee. They would, that's, that's the right way to go. Uh, and also the comment about uh, Ms. Crockett. She's terrific. We mm -hmm. really like working with her in ordinance. Good. Further comments? Chris. 
So I clearly had a lot of time on the flights today because I ran through this whole packet. Um, <laughs> a couple of questions. Uh, first one is how long is a perm? What's the duration of the permit? One year? The mooring permit? Yes, one yes. year. One year. one year. So that doesn't, is, there's no mention of the time, whether it's annual or renewal or anything in here. So that might want to be clarified. Um, and uh, if they do not get a mooring inspection, does that mean they lose their mooring permit? Because I didn't see any, it just said that you had to have it done, but there's no or what's. No consequence. No consequence, no teeth, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, and then I, I looked at this as that boats must be in uh, on the page two, the boats must have been moored by July 1 yeah. of the permitted year. The mooring permit shall be revoked. Right. Uh, are there any exceptions to that? I mean, what if somebody is pulling the hull for maintenance or something and they bought the mooring and now they're not in on July 1st? Is there an exception to that? It says or? the harbor master may permit variations from specs if in his or her judgment the proposed okay. mooring, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. So, so the harbor master care. has authority yes. to grant. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So then I would just go back to my initial other ones of the duration of the permit isn't anywhere in the ordinance, uh, or at least I couldn't find it. Uh, and also, uh, what is the consequence if they do not have a mooring inspection certificate? Good. Thank you for those. We can look at them both. Further comments? Uh, uh, this really was uh, an effort to introduce fairness into a mooring system that had some abuses. Uh, and uh, uh, I particularly like the fact that uh, boats now have to be in the water uh, and, it, and, the, and the rental of the mooring uh, is now clarified as that's not uh, something that's a, a right just because you hold the mooring. So uh, some very good uh, updates. Uh, this had been brought to our attention by the town clerk uh, as something that really required this, uh, this sort of uh, do-over. So uh, ready to vote. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. <coughs> Order 18... 69, first reading, scheduled public hearing, second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 1301, the General Assistance Ordin Ordinance, pursuant to Title 22, MRSA 4305, Section 4. And the uh, introduction sure. com comes from the town manager. Yes, this is an annual right of passage. The state mm -hmm. has... Um, promulgated the new general assistance maximums. Uh, frankly, we don't have any um, ability to modify this at the local level. Uh, you may recall we inquired as to whether we could have a blanket approval that simply they are whatever the state says. They said no, the legislative body must take uh, affirmative action uh, regarding each of the, the changes. So this matter's back before you, but I sadly report that you have no control to do anything different. No homework. <laughs> that may shorten the discussion. <laughs> uh, a public wishing to address this issue, please approach the podium. Accept the motion. So moved. moved. Second. A discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Non action items, none. Uh, standing special committee reports. Chris, we'll start down with you. So, uh, Energy Met, we talked about the comp plan as well as an analysis for the uh, Trigen that's come back. Um, still some things to work on with that. They were very interested in talking about some possible uh, uh, energy or conservation issues to be put forward for the Scarborough Downs, to have something included in that, and how staff was going to include that. I think uh, staff was going to meet with the development team to not so much as, as a requirement, but more as a suggestion type of thing, I think. Um, long range planning has met multiple, multiple times. Uh, I was asked to uh, put out some dates for the draft comp plan, and these are public uh, meetings. They're more informational sessions um, to, to learn where we're at and get some feedback as well. There's uh, October 4th at Piper Shores at 7 p.m. October 4th at the Dunstan Fire Barn at 6.30 p.m. And then uh, October 10th at the North Grange Hall at 7 p.m. Uh, there's been a commitment to have at least two to three committee members plus staff at each one of those meetings. So it's an opportunity for people to come and ask questions and give input. Um, and I would encourage people to engage because uh, we're getting to the point where we're starting the, the rough drafts and uh, now's the time to get engaged. So that's all. Thank you. Peter. Nothing this evening. Good. Jean Marie. Nothing. Nothing. 
I, I have something, but can I ask a question of uh, Councilor Piazza? Did, has there been an updated draft since uh, from the feedback yet? No, so <coughs> still I'm the original of, yeah. first uh, yeah, draft. Yeah, I think okay. we're still in the original first draft. Thing. Thank you. Um, I had two, <coughs> two items to report. Um, <coughs> Uh, Historic Preservation Implementation Committee met last night. Unfortunately, I was unable to attend as I was on my way back from Boston, uh, but I received an update from ch the chair this evening with something he wanted to report out, which was on the 22nd. Um, we had um, some of the members of that committee had gone to the Honeywell House, opened it up to the public, uh, and we had 60 or 70 people come by, which really shows a high level of interest in, uh, in, in that building as well as historic uh, uh, properties around town. So we're really pleased about that and are intending to try and make that an annual thing. So um, uh, I took my girls by and we got to poke around a little bit. It was really, it was fun. So hopefully other people got to as well. Um, uh, Scarborough Housing Alliance um, also met um, and we had received some, some feedback from the planning board around the amendment that we had put um, forth. Um, a few weeks ago, if you, if you recall, it came through. Uh, we, we were actually working off the wrong document. Um, somehow our working draft had made it through um, first read here in the council, and it, it, it was very confusing. Uh, there were things that, were, that we had struck out, which were kind of on our draft, that, we had, that aren't in the current uh, ordinance, so it was just very misleading. And um, so we, we reworked it. Um, made sure that it was cleaned up, and then uh, uh, Mr. Chase took it away and uh, and put it back in, a, in an appropriate markup language. Um, and then it's, it's going to come back in a first read. It's significantly, the intent is really no different, um, but the substance is uh, different, and so it'll, it'll come back. And I, my apologies for that. That, that made it through. Um, that's all I have. Councilor Bayba. Yes, just one item uh, for the appointments committee. Um, the uh, staff has been negotiating the dispatcher's bargaining unit contract that needs to our review uh, from the, uh, the committee. So I'd like to inquire so that we can post it tonight if uh, the two gentlemen with me can meet next Monday, uh, maybe five. five Mr. Three. Hall, is that okay, do you think? It is. It's, it's a holiday. Oh, um, um, so let's do, uh, I can't do Tuesday, but maybe Wednesday? Is that too late? Oh, we, have a, we have a 5.30 appointment <coughs> meeting scheduled for Wednesday, the 10th. But I'm also supposed to be at the North Grange at 7, and we have right. a workshop now. Right, so. Ten of the workshop. Ten of the workshop. There's something scheduled. You tell, me when, <laughs> but you tell me when that you can meet. Well, the workshop is, what, going to be 6? That's fine. So uh, we could meet at 5.30. We've got to be here anyway. Okay. I, I thought we weren't going to have the workshop on the 10th, because we now the time right. pressure has changed. Anyway, I think it'd probably be best to find another alternative date, but uh, yeah, not okay. too far in the future. Could be 17th. 10th at 5.30, tentatively? Mr. Kazar, I can do it. Uh, it'll be a quick one, because I, I need to get to the North Grange Hall by 7. Okay. okay. I'll be there. Then I need to get there by 6.30. Okay. Start. Uh, start, can you meet at 5? Because I know yeah, you're, you're yeah, in a different uh, no, time. No, I can't meet... Five thirty. It'll it'll have to be five okay. five fifteen or five thirty. Yeah. Five thirty. Five fifteen. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had, sir. Uh, uh, town manager's report. Yes, two quick items. Uh, I've been working with the council chair. I think he's made you aware. Uh, the public safety building project committee would like to uh, come forward to provide an update to the council. We intend to do that at a workshop at six fifteen prior to your next meeting on the seventeenth. Uh, in spite of our best efforts, there's still about a $460,000 challenge. Now, I should note we have contingency that will cover that, but we don't believe it's prudent that we start the project using all contingencies. So they'd like to update you, provide some context as to why that's the case, and I think provide you with some options that we might all consider. Uh, secondly, just as a general matter, you might have noticed on your way in, we had a, have a poster in the lobby here. Uh, the residential reval process is underway. We have done posters, uh, press releases. We intend to do uh, postcards um, as we move into different areas of town. And I just really want to encourage folks to be as cooperative as they can. Uh, it's really in everyone's best interest to allow the data collector into your property and make sure it's properly recorded. And if they're unable to make contact with you when they come by, they will make follow-up visit attempts. 
uh, not unlimited, but uh, that's part of the contract uh, contractual requirement. So uh, it's going to be a busy year uh, working through uh, all 9,000 properties in town. And uh, we certainly want to do our best to avoid some of the time challenges we had with the commercial revalve. I'd like to have this wrapped up well in advance of the commitment such that we can have adequate time for folks to understand the new values, come in, uh, and separate it from commitment as best we can. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Councilor uh, comments? I'll start down with Councilor Davis. So, uh, I'm tired. I apologize. Um, <laughs> but I, I heard a couple of things at the podium this morning, or this afternoon, that I'd like some clarity on. Uh, there were some pretty derogatory comments made, mm. and we've got rules of speaking, and I'd like to know what we're going to do about that, because I, I was uncomfortable allowing that to continue in public, uh, and I don't necessarily have a say as a counselor other than to stand up and shout objection, and I don't want to put us in that kind of situation again. Uh, however, I think we do need to have some kind of decorum and some kind of guidelines that don't allow people to, to get up and just make claims, public claims against individuals like that. I, I, I've got a real problem with that. So I know we've discussed it, you know, vaguely or in general how we're going to approach that. Uh, I don't know if there's an answer. Uh, suffice to say, um, I, I just, I'm uncomfortable letting stuff like that happen, especially if the person being accused of the right to defend themselves in any way, shape, or form. And that's kind of the purpose of having those rules up there. Um, so um, I, I'd like to see us do something uh, along the lines of enforcement there. Um, with the existing rules we have, and I know we've talked to legal counsel on that. Um, I, I just think that something something needs to be done. I, I don't think that's uh, appropriate. So, that's all I'm saying. Nothing this evening. I'm good. Councilor so, Gatterino. Um, nothing other than I thought one of the speakers made the comment, and I wrote it down because I really liked it, that just remembering our shared responsibility in public-private partnerships, and I do think that we forget um, both as citizens or as employees of towns or elected officials that, you know, there is a certain amount of public-private partnership that has to occur in order for things to move forward. So, you know, I just like the way that that speaker talked about that. That's so, I just wanted to make a comment on that. Just people remind, remember that. Councilor Fuller. Uh, I'll keep it to three quick things. Number one, I have been remiss in reaching out to Larissa Crockett, um, but I have just re I received from, a, I want to say six different people, uh, just huge accolades for the way she's conducted herself and helped with the um, Downs uh, sessions. And uh, for a lot of those people, it was the first time ever really uh, interacting with her. And um, I don't know that, you know, she gets enough feedback always because she's not the one sitting with us at the table. So just want to let her know publicly uh, that, that her work was appreciated. Uh, secondly, I uh, really want to encourage all of the candidates for town council to stay engaged with what we're doing here with the Downs. One of the concerns I've heard and one thing I don't want to see happen is someone say now we have to wait another two months for them to get caught up to speed. There's no reason why they can't be going through this process with us. We're all available for conversation. Um, so I want them to be very much a part of the, these conversations and ready to rock and roll. It you know, could not be that all that different. We don't know. But um, just want to put that out there. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, I just, I, I really, I, I thought Paul O'Brien coined the, the phrase of the night with the downtown yeah. triple crown. <laughs> and I really, uh, I really believe this could be that for our town. Um, and I hope, uh, I, despite the robust discussion tonight and a lot of back and forth, um, I know collaborative processes are messy, but that's typically when the best work gets done. And so I'm very uh, pleased that we had that conversation. And I do think over time, taking the time is going to get this through the, the right way. So anyway, downtown Triple Crown, I think it's cool. <laughs> Uh, two things. First one is Candidates Night uh, is um, October 11th, which is next Thursday. Uh, I believe it's from 6 until 9. So um, hopefully you, you can tune in and uh, or show up and um, get, a, get an idea of who people are. There are a lot of people on the ballot. So um, the only other thing was I just wanted to um, uh, share something on my Facebook page uh, regarding uh, what the town is calling the Quiet Riot. Uh, community services is holding a sensory-friendly oh, Halloween oh, right, party. 
on October 27th. Um, it's from six until nine and it looks really awesome. There's gonna be uh, lots of activity um, in, and uh, everyone will get their own set of headphones on the dance floor so that you can control the volume. Um, so I think it'll actually be pretty entertaining. Uh, there'll be a costume um, uh, judging component, I think. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to share my appreciation um, with community service for putting this on because I think it's a, a great event. Um, so I want to uh, cover a couple of things. First is I think Councilor Chiazzo touched upon, I think, a very important piece, and that has to deal with the purpose and intent of public comment. I think that um, we have seen um, on a couple of occasions that the intent is not to be neighborly. Unfortunately, it comes from someone that doesn't live here. And I do think that we do need to maybe direct the manager to talk um, or to do something as far as speaking with legal counsel or whatever it might be. The, the, there's got to be something that's just pure, plain out deflammatory um, with no basis of fact or anything. Um, and I don't think that's right, especially for our employees. Um, they have rights as well. Um, second is I did want to mention um, uh, there was a gentleman that spoke quite well regarding that public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to narrow it down to something even more simple to five words. Um, you need to spend money to make money. And that's the essence of what this agreement is. Um, it's about what do we want to contribute in order to um, make um, more uh, revenue um, in the long term. And I hope that people can kind of understand that while being cautious. Um, I did want to also uh, mention that someone had talked about, you know, the last comprehensive plan which guided us, which was 2004, 2005, was approved in 06. And um, the comment was something around, um, um, well, they probably didn't expect what we have today because they expected more retail. I can tell you, having been on the council, that exactly what we have in Scarborough is what they expected through that comprehensive plan. Everything from, and I'll go down as far as what, um, I don't know what the name of the building is now, but um, the old Humpty Dumpty plant, which right. is, I think, Great Falls Marketing, right. including, I think it was Kodak. Mm -hmm. They did the cameras, and uh, um, you know, there's a gym up in there now, and I mean, that was part of it. Going all the way out to Dunstan Village and the new Dunstan Tap and Table, right. all of that has been part of what was envisioned at that time, especially the concentration of research and medical um, that was on Route 1. There was a, um, a significant conversation, I remember, um, did not want significant retail with drive-throughs and things that you normally see on a, on a Route 1 corridor through many, many communities. So I think we have exactly what was expected. Um, and I think that the next comprehensive plan will also guide us in that same fashion. Um, I do think that, um, I already mentioned this, I'm not going to mention it again. Um, I wanted to mention about the sign ordinance. Um, again, um, I have a, just a personal, I, I think it's horrible that we advertise people's addresses, even as counselors because you never know how people are going to act and think people act kind of strangely sometimes as well as, um, you know, this is more about reporters because we don't do this here, but, you know, where you work, um, you know, people think that they have a right to do things that really aren't acceptable. Um, but I did want to mention too is that maybe as part of our education around signs is that um, a lot of people feel that the um, right away areas that are in front of their homes are theirs and therefore you can't put a sign out there, um, even though it's in a right way. I would hope candidates would be sensitive to realize that if it's truly a sidewalk area that's in a residential neighborhood, that you wouldn't do that. But there's those people who live on those corners, like I do, in which citizens do have a right to put it within that right away, which is from the center of the road, there's a certain footage, and I don't know what it is, 25. Um, but generally speaking, look at where the light posts are, or the electrical posts are, or the, uh, you know, the CMP poles. That's in the right of way. So, you know, think about um, that because um, it's very sensitive for a lot of people. And then I wanted to um, mention, oh, um, October 9th, I believe, Ms. Cole, if, if you can correct me, um, absentee voting starts mm -hmm. as the official date. So I hope people start thinking about that because it's just next week um, and it's during normal business hours here at Town Hall. I'm sure there'll be other information shared about that. And then I did want to mention the reason why I voted on um, both the outside analysis issue as well as um, as well as the public hearing piece is that um, I have one I have incredible trust with the staff that we have um, there's one thing to not trust the assumptions that were used because you disagree with it and to say outright that you disagree with it but to su suggest that the analysis because um, in a very sensitive community where costs are important not knowing what this outside analysis is going to cause should be a concern and not one person brought that up um, so I think it's um, a matter of convenience when we're willing to spend money on one thing but not on another and not identify where it comes from. I don't disagree with spending it, and I support 
some analysis because it's going to be good information. And if this person can predict what's going to happen in Scarborough the next 30 years, um, I will be happy to leave this seat and give it to him because he would be a much better counsel than I would if he had that predictability. Um, so, but it will be nice to see um, that information. And then on the public hearing piece is that it's a public hearing to hear from the constituents about everything. So I don't have a problem having it on the 24th. I don't have a problem having one next week and then one every week thereafter up until whenever we make that final decision. So that's why I supported it because whether it's the 24th, the 17th, or the 7th, or it does not um, uh, uh, direct us on what that final decision has to be. We could push that decision out to January and have a public hearing next week. It doesn't d mandate that. So that's why um, I took that position. Um, and then last but not least, I did want to mention, because this is the only rebuttal on which I'm getting regarding this issue, because no one has said not to do the CEA. Um, and that has to deal with the referendum process. And I just want to be clear to people that are asking me is that I will not support sending it to a referendum because I think it violates our charter. It's very clear in section 203 and 2047, because I looked it up, that says that this council is um, responsible for making that decision. And in return, if we make the wrong decision, the citizens have a citizen initiative process. That is no different than the recall process that occurred as well as no different than what happened with the Great American Neighborhood when the council approved that project. So there is a recourse for any decisions that are made that are within the confines of the construct of our charter, and I respect the forefathers that created that to guide us in, in making that decision. So I, I just wanted people to understand that. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to thank all of you for staying focused. This was a long meeting, and, and we, we spent a lot of time uh, uh, hearing comments uh, from the public on Scarborough Downs. It's a complicated matter. Uh, we're still learning, and so uh, uh, it really does take some focus to, uh, to stay on track. Uh, I thought we did advance our uh, understanding of some of the elements of the project. Uh, I did want to say, if there's anything that people really feel strongly about, that they want to see introduced into that agreement, talk to me about that. I know Will has now twice referenced uh, restraints on the sale of the property and what the consequence of that would be. Uh, and the town manager did point out the normal way you deal with that is permission will not be unreasonably withheld. Uh, but uh, uh, I, whatever it might be, I just use that as an example, not as something that I'm advocating. Uh, uh, let us know because uh, we're going to, over some period of time, get down to uh, uh, a really specific agreement, and I want people to be comfortable with that. So uh, with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. Thank you.